welcome back onto the stage, Gareth Ike. We got beat up, beat up, beat up, beat up, and beat up. I will clean up, clean up, clean up, clean up, and clean up. Yeah, we stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, be counter. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up and glow. Rise up and glow. It's me. They have to get moved so that can come down. Honestly, I'm like Moses, you can't get the staff. That's Gareth Ike, by the way. He's the living proof that being able to sing is not a genetic inheritance. <laughs> I could clear this bloody room in five minutes. Another thing, oh, hello. I'm me. The, um, I, say, I don't have a go at the person because they're just doing what they're told. But we just had a visit from the independent newspaper. You know, I was talking about that thing. After the, after the two and a half hours for which everything that follows from now on has to be heard to put it into context, uh, they turn up and they're going to leave for a deadline for tomorrow's paper. Uh, and they're going to do a report on this event. I mean, bloody hell. No wonder people are turning to alternative news outlets. Okay, let's go.
And to be fair to the person involved who's just doing her job, what chance has she got, even if she wanted to, of putting this event in context, having missed the first three and a half hours and missing probably most of what's to come after this section? Anyway, let's have a recap. This is, uh, this is who we are. We are infinite awareness, having an experience. Uh, the idea of the conspiracy is to make us identify with the experience. Boom! Little me, I have no power. I am all limited. I am uh, just someone who has to follow others. And to manipulate the way we decode reality to fit the ability of the few to control the many by keeping the many in a fraction of who they really are by identifying with name, with job, with family and income bracket instead of the true nature of infinite self and to hijack the way we decode reality through the five senses to impose a very different one to give us the idea that we must follow we have no power someone else must tell us what to think what to do and it's control of perception like I said earlier if you control someone's perception you control their actions which come from perceptions and uh, that's the idea. And all these things, uh, interestingly, all those news organizations, what are they doing? They're telling people what to think. Um, and the other thing is that when you, as, especially as we go through the section after this one, all the different expressions of this conspiracy, uh, everything from banking scams to uh, vaccines to uh, fake human-caused global warming, uh, stuff in... Uh, additives in food, fake uh, terrorist attacks so that you can change society by justifying change. The idea that all this is being orchestrated by men and women in dark suits or whatever sitting around a table, it takes on the bounds of ludicrousness. Do these e exist? Of course they do. But they are the outer, outer rim of the rabbit hole. And when you go beyond them, deeper into uh, the uh, manipulation, you go through them into the advisors. The people that we think are in power, that's only for public consumption. They're here today, gone tomorrow people in all the areas of institutions and politics. And another bunch will come along tomorrow, but the same force will be controlling them as well. That's the common theme, that's the cement. And you hit the advisors one step back. You go deeper in the rabbit hole and you go into these really exclusive secret societies which are way uh, uh, back out of the public domain and yet they are fundamentally influencing and impacting on what happens in the public domain. So when you've got someone like Obama, um, he is announcing legislation, he's signing executive orders and death lists for bloody drone missiles in uh, Pakistan etc. But he ain't the one who's deciding all this. He's the one that's the point that brings it into reality through legislative change. Um, and so behind all these apparently unconnected areas like uh, banks and biotech uh, cartels and uh, NATO and the World Health Organization, World Trade Organization, uh, the media and all this stuff at ownership level is this same force in the background. Um, and indeed, you know, to a certain extent, this was acknowledged by the uh, Swiss Institute of Technology in Zurich um, when they did this study on the connections between transnational corporations. And they found that these ones that are really red, these very, very few, have so many connections to the others, that in effect, that's one unit, which is what I've been saying for bloody years, that behind the apparent uh, independence of these corporations, they're actually controlled and connected into the same uh, group. And, you know, you've got these green lines connecting these transnational corporations, but around this group, there's so many connections, it's just one blob of green. Um, and when you take the uh, next step and you realize that the same network of families are actually controlling all these apparently unconnected transnational corporations, suddenly you can see that it's possible to push the world through all these different aspects of society in a uh, common direction. So we have this thing, you call it globalization. What is globalization? It is the centralization of power in every area of our lives. 
When there's a few and you want to control the many, you have to centralize decision making. The more diversity of decision making there is, the more uh, power uh, obviously is diverted away from the center. The more you centralize, the fewer have control of, of more and more and more. So this is why we've seen this process of so-called globalization, which is what? It is centralizing power into fewer and fewer hands, so fewer and fewer people are having a bigger, bigger say and impact on more and more people. This is the idea. It's the only way you can do it. And like I think I said earlier, the more you centralize power, the more power you have at the center to centralize even quicker. That's why this process of centralization has got faster and faster. And as you can see, as we saw in the Olympics, the power of the corporations, the British public put in like nine billion into the Olympics and uh, the corporations together put in about a billion and yet they got everything. So much so that little people in their, in their businesses or homes were being threatened with bloody uh, with the law if they just put some of the major symbols of the Olympics or words, you know, in a display. I was on the Isle of Wight. I just went out of interest, took a few pictures when the flame came through. I want to see what happened. This little town on the Isle of Wight, these cows, that you would never know the Olympic flame was coming through. There was nothing. Why? Because they were all terrified of being uh, sued by uh, the corporations and those uh, in government representing the corporations that had hijacked the Olympics. Uh, so it doesn't matter who is the president or prime minister, because the same force is in control. What force is that? And if you look at these underground bases, they call them DUMS, deep underground military bases, they're all over the world. The, the level of uh, security clearance to uh, go deep into these bases and know what's going on is way above anybody political leader. They haven't got a clue what's going on in here. So they get elected and they have a, oh, he's a prime minister, he's got power, oh, someone else has come in. And while all that's going on, someone's running these bloody things without the people in political power, apparent power, they having a clue about it. If we find who, who is running these things, then we're getting very close to who's actually running the direction of human society. So behind it all is a force. The question is, what is it? So this is where we enter the, the twilight zone. But it's a twilight zone. Again, everything is a point of observation. A twilight zone to a mainstream journalist will be perfectly bloody logical to someone who's done 50 uh, 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 years or so, or 25 years, or how many years it is of research into something. Um, and. Uh, this is an important point about perception. One of the greatest ways that humanity is controlled is by the suppression of the sense of the possible. Once you put a wall on the sense of the possible, gotcha! Because anything that comes in, say the lie, if the uh, sense of the possible is not fluid but rigid it will have no alternative to the lie I'll give you an example if the mind is so rigid about possibility that it cannot perceive the fact that you can mind manipulate someone to either go shooting people uh, uh, in, a, in a crazy shooting or be in the wrong place at the wrong time to be blamed for it when someone else has actually done it then when the government comes out, whatever it is, and gives you the version of, of uh, Don Blaine or gives you a version of uh, uh, the Colorado shooting in the theater and the, the shooting in the, uh, the uh, Sikh temple in Wisconsin, then you have no alternative to the lie because you can't perceive the possibility of anything else. But if you've got an open mind and an inquiring mind and a much wider sense of the possible, then you can look at the lie from another perspective and say, well, maybe this is what happened. So controlling the sense of the possible, because if you're doing things out here and you've got the sense of the possible here, then when people like me say, this is what's going on, that goes, you're bloody mad. That's not possible. That can't be going on. Um, and, and the biggest problem is that, and it's not every one of them, by the way, I was talking to one the other day who was uh, very kind of intelligent involved, involved, involved in all this, but this in general is my experience after a, a 25 years of the uh, perception of the possible of a mainstream bloody journalist. 
And that's why, that's why people who speak the greater truth and have done throughout the period of the media have invariably been ridiculed and dismissed because that cannot perceive that the possibility that it can be true. And control of history is also a massive part of this. George Orwell talked in uh, 1984 about basically who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past, in the sense of if you can give a fake version of how we got here, you are going to give people a big uh, distorted fix on where they are. So history is a real target to distort, to give a, 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 a distorted version of what's happening now. So let's go through history and let's go in the twilight zone, but from my perspective, perfectly logical from my research. Um, some time ago, probably a very long time ago, um, this reality, that the part that we're experiencing, what we call the world, the earth, was hijacked. And it was hijacked through entities that operate outside of human sight. Now as we talked in the first uh, two and uh, half hours, visible light, which is the only uh, frequency range that humans can perceive in the conscious mind, is tiny. Anything that operates outside of that we can't see. But it can, if it's close enough in frequency terms, interact with this reality. And the, uh, the world that is described in ancient accounts all over the world, it's a real common theme, uh, that preceded this hijack was in many ways similar to that portrayed in the Avatar movie. It was a world where human consciousness was much more expanded. It understood the connections between everything. It understood that at the energetic, electromagnetic level, that you could communicate with plants, you could communicate with animals, you could communicate with apparently uh, inanimate objects, which are only inanimate, inanimate on the holographic level uh, to our perception. And there was this sense of oneness, this, this sense of connectiveness, this sense of understanding that we are with just a point of attention within a greater whole. And it was a heart society, going on from what I said earlier. We, they, they rather interacted with reality from the heart center rather than the gut, which is where most people in our society today do. In other words, we were coming from this heart vortex uh, area. Now, as I talked about, this is a, an access point through the illusion into the, the greater whole. And so when you're coming from a heart connection and a heart perception of society, it is dramatically different and creates a dramatically different society to the one we have now. But then came what I call the schism, a massive distortion in the information waveform construct of this reality. And uh, as this distortion happened, uh, there was a distortion in, as I talked about earlier again, the electromagnetic forces that hold the planets and planetary bodies in a, uh, some kind of stable orbit and a lot of these planets went walkabout. The solar system we see today is not how it was in the relatively uh, recent past. Uh, this is a, a book called The Saturn Myth by a researcher called David Tolbert. It's probably the best book on ancient symbolism that, that I've ever come across. Uh, it's absolutely first class research came out some years ago now, um, and from his massive uh, uh, detailed research over many, many years of uh, ancient accounts and descriptions and symbols, he found all these common themes relating to the fact that what we today call Saturn was not where it is now and was not what it is now in terms of the rings and what have you but was much, much closer to the Earth, to the point that it was in terms of, because it's, it's not a planet Saturn, it's a dwarf star, so is Jupiter. And it was um, the, the, the prime source of light, as the solar system was before this great distortion, this great cataclysm. And looking from the Earth, you saw um, Venus, and in the middle of that you saw uh, Mars. And here's another you know, mock-up of the view of this from, from the Earth. Therefore, Saturn, 
as it would, became absolutely the center of focus of Earth's society before all this happened. Now, people like uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky in the 50s and 60s, he was massively ridiculed for coming out with a series of books um, pointing out that in his view and his research there was massive cataclysmic events in the solar system and the planets and planetary bodies aren't now where they once were not that long ago. Of course he was ridiculed, of course he was dismissed, but uh, he, was a, he was a fantastic pioneer for not detailed truth in everything that he said. How can you do that when you're trying to uncover something that doesn't want to be uncovered? But it was a fantastic trailblazing theme that he had, which has been taken up by people like uh, David Talbot and Wallace Thornhill. Wallace Thornhill is uh, uh, involved very, very strongly with the electric universe research that I talked about earlier. And um, he uh, adds his physics and electronics background to David Talbot's uh, ancient uh, symbolism and uh, accounts uh, background. Um, Saturn, which I say didn't look like that in those days, and Jupiter were certainly involved in this, these cataclysms. And the effect on the Earth is one of the great universal themes in every ancient culture. Of course, we have the classic coming through the Bible of the... Um, the, the great uh, flood and Noah and, and what have you, but that is just a rewrite of more ancient texts in Mesopotamia, and, and it's the same theme all over the world, a fantastic geological um, uh, and uh, cataclysmic events that basically brought the uh, society that was there then to an end. That's Avatar society that I was talking about. And when you look at it, you look at some of the the great um, earth upheavals that we've had. Things like uh, the tsunami in Japan and, and great um, uh, earthquakes. Now, they're devastating. I mean, the tsunami was unbelievable um, uh, in Japan and also the one the, the earlier that was massively destructive. But at least there was the ability of people unaffected to come and help. When you have a global cataclysm, like the one all these ancient accounts describe, then there ain't no one coming, because everyone's in the same situation. And if that happened today, very soon, first of all, what we call civilization will be over. Electricity, gone. Everything to do with electricity, gone. Oil, anything to do with it, gone. It would immediately become a primitive society from the perspective of today. And soon, the uh, knowledge of the, of the uh, more advanced society that was destroyed would be lost, that it would only be passed over in myths and stuff like that. And of course it has been. We, the the uh, endless stories about uh, great continents, which could be called Atlantis and Mu or Lemuria, um, in the Pacific and the uh, Atlantic, crashing under the waves in this great cataclysm. And um, under the sea, around the world, are certainly some extraordinary uh, buildings and uh, cities that were once above the surface of the water. Now, as I mentioned in the first half, the base construct of this universe is waveform information. So any distortion at that level, and this is where the whole thing was created from, this massive cataclysmic event, will play through to the holographic as great distortions that we will see as great geological and, and weather events. And it was at this point that the, the solar system became eventually what it is now. And a lot of researchers into this area of the cataclysm look at the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter and say, well, they, they, their view, they may well be right, but that's the remnant of some planet or planets that operated in that area before the great cataclysm. So when it happened, the, the crazies moved in this force that I'm talking about, that I used to say, and in many, many, many of the ancient texts say, were behind the creation of this cataclysm. Not only that, because the mind also works in this waveform uh, level, any distortion at that level will distort human perception, will distort the human mind. And we went from, when I say we, I mean humanity, went from a connected society, an open, uh, aware, um, expanded consciousness society into the one that eventually became 
the controlled society and even more controlled society that we see today. And these entities were behind it. And the heart uh, interaction also was a victim of this great cataclysmic happening. Because what happened, uh, not least because of the distortion, but also because of the, the impact of these entities, um, we moved from being a heart-centered, heart-perception society into the gut. I mean, today, when I say the gut, I mean the emotion. We interact with society today and events today through emotion overwhelmingly. Uh, more and more, what does your heart say has become what does your gut tell you? And we're emotionally, we're reacting, we're not thinking, we're not uh, feeling, we're reacting emotionally. And that has massive um, benefits for the manipulating forces I'll come to. And so the more that we dropped into this gut-based emotion reacting society, the more we got pulled out of that heart coherence I talked about earlier, um, which brings the heart electromagnetic uh, field into coherence with the, uh, the, the brain and with the um, other systems to create this uh, connection that takes you, as the Heart Math Institute in America found, into this higher level of consciousness. In other words, boom, it went the other way. And like I say, the Institute of Heart Math talks about when you go from the heart vortex, the heart electromagnetic field, you go out of the bounds of time and space, the illusion, into the greater understanding of self. So this hijack more and more closed that connection down and we became a five sense society overwhelmingly and therefore locked in to this tiny band of frequency we call visible light uh, and at the expense of the wider perception that this is just part of who we are, not the totality of it. And more and more the body-mind level got disconnected from the greater consciousness level and once that happens then we're in real, real trouble. We then start to see this as the only reality instead of realizing that this is uh, the, the totality and the infinity of what we are beyond this tiny band of frequencies we call the world. Now these entities I'm talking about are talked about and mentioned in every ancient society under different names. Um, and these are interesting to me. Uh, this is what they're called by some Central American shaman, the flyers, just the name. We have the demons in Christianity. We have the archons, that, that is the name for these entities of the Gnostic belief and the Gnostic writings uh, from like 2,000 years ago, around that period and, and, and later. And the Islamic jinn. Because the way all of these uh, entities or phenomenon are described is precisely the same in effect. They're different names for the same thing. And uh, the archons, as the Gnostics called them, uh, were said to be made from luminous fire. The jinn from Islamic and pre-Islamic Arabia um, were said to be made of smokeless fire. And when you, you, you look at what's said about it, they're talking about the same force, the same phenomenon. So what is it? Um, the Gnostics are very, very interesting. Gnostic coming from a word meaning knowledge. Whenever Gnostic thinkers um, showed any sign of getting their point across and, and circulating their, their knowledge and their beliefs, they were slaughtered. I mean, that is just a, 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 a constant. The uh, Cathars that were slaughtered in southern France uh, ending up on the the, the castle of Montségur in 1244, they were Gnostic thinkers. The people that ran the great uh, library of Alexandria with its half a million scrolls of ancient knowledge which the Roman church destroyed, they were Gnostic uh, thinkers. And as a result of this, very little Gnostic writing has, has, has made it through what we call history. But then in 1945, a place called Nag Hammadi in uh, Egypt, a sealed jar of Gnostic writings was found uh, hidden. And from that has come a fantastic, um, fantastically greater understanding of what the Gnostics were talking about. These were mystics. They went out into other levels of reality. Uh, what we, in many ways, 
we call them shaman today, uh, many of them. Um, and uh, this is what they talk about in these writings. They talk about Lord, the Lord Archon, or what they call the Demiurge, and the Archons that serve the Demiurge and uh, uh, the, the Lord Archon, as they call him. And they relate this to the Judeo-Christian Yahweh Jehovah God. They also relate it, in, in effect, to the, what people call Satan or the devil as well. They say that these Archons created the physical universe that we see, but not the Earth, the Sun, or the Moon. And it's interesting that those three bodies have tremendous connections geometrically and mathematically, which none of the other planets do. Anyway, Archon um, means prince, ruler, authorities, and it has the connotation also of being from the beginning, because the, um, the Gnostics said that actually the, the, from the beginning of this uh, solar system that we uh, see and experience, they have been here, because they were actually the creators of it, apart from the, those bodies I'm talking about. They talk about the, the Demiurge being a fake god that created the physical material reality that we perceive. Um, and they talk about these entities being inorganic, like cyborgs, like robotic. Um, and these writings are about 1,600 years old, a bit more maybe. And yet they knew that in terms of the relationship between the Earth and the rest of the solar system, the Earth was alive and organic, and the rest of the solar system was basically not alive and inorganic. How did they know that? Because they were able to get out there and were, were very, very knowledgeable. Um, uh, and that's why they were attacked by that which didn't want that knowledge circulating. This, in effect, is uh, very much a, a, the feeling of what they describe as an Archon world, because the Archons have no creativity, as humans do, and therefore, their world is stark and, 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 and ugly and uniform. This is another wonderful uh, symbolic picture of an archon world, an archon reality. And um, that's because these writings say they have no, I think the direct translation is no intentionality. I, I put it another way, no creative imagination. And the writings uh, from the best part of 2,000 years ago make it clear that they envy humans who have this creative um, imagination, this the ability to create. Uh, like I say, they, they describe the Archons as cyborgs, a robotic race that can imitate but not innovate. They call it, in a, in a translated word, counter-mimicry. Put simply, if you gave them a blank sheet of paper, they would know what to do with it. But you give them a, blank, a sheet of paper, rather, with something on it, with something created on it, and they are able to distort it and twist it. But they, cannot, they can mimic and imitate. They cannot create in, the, in that sense. Interestingly, they also use the word fantasia. And in that sense, what they're saying is that these archons, jinn, different names, but I'll use the word archon as a consistent, um, have the ability to create fake realities, to distort reality, counter-mimicry, to give people the view or the feeling of a perception that seems real but isn't. Mind parasites, they possess the mind and influence the mind in a negative way, particularly in a negatively emotional way. The one word they say that can absolutely describe the Archons is deception. And also they say that one of their great means of operation, modus operandi, is to inver invert everything. That's what they're doing, counter-mimicry. They are inverting what is already created so it becomes something else. And it's no accident that uh, what are the great forces that worship these archons within human society, what we call Satanism, uh, use uh, inversion as part of its symbolism. The inverted cross, the inverted um, five-pointed star. And so I've used this quote before in talks, and, and from this archontic uh, perception, it becomes even more relevant. Michael Elner, who said, just look at us. 
Everything is backwards. Everything is upside down. Doctors destroy health, lawyers destroy justice, universities destroy knowledge, governments destroy freedom, the major media destroy information, and religions destroy spirituality. Everything inverted. This is classic. Politicians, knowingly, some of them, most of them unknowingly, that are promoters and uh, pushers of the archontic agenda, they are famous for bloody lying, inversion, inversion of truth. This is a quote from the uh, English writer Noel Coward, who said, quite rightly, it is discouraging to think how many people are shocked by honesty and how few by deceit. Such is the level of deceit in our society. One word to describe our, the archontic influence, deception. So this force I talked about earlier that operates behind the crazies in politics and banking and business and media ownership and all the other stuff uh, is this archontic force, which takes many expressions as I'll come to. And this is absolutely massively significant. The Gnostics talk about something called HAL in relation to these archontic manipulators. And HAL means, in, in our translation, simulation of a virtual reality. A reality that appears real to the decoder, but is not actually real. It's a fake reality. Um, and given what I've been talking about for a few years now, the Gnostic texts describe reptilian entities in relation to being an expression of this archontic force. And 1,600 bloody years ago, they described grey entities and they describe them as being expressions of the Archons and they say these grey entities are like an unformed baby or a fetus with grey skin and dark unmoving eyes. They were around thousands of years ago. We think they're a modern phenomenon. No, no, this manipulation has been going on for a fantastic amount of what we call time. So, you know, one of the, another, you know, what can we ridicule, what, what's the latest thing to ridicule Ike for? Well, right, let's get a list. They must be adding to it by now. He's been talking for a while at that Wembley place. Um, but one of the things they ridicule me for is the idea that repti reptilian entities are behind this manipulation of human society. And uh, uh, people can deny their existence if they like. I do not give a shit. They exist. <laughs> This, this is, um, this is a, a Spanish artist called Robert Illimos. I spoke in Barcelona, was it 2011, something like that? And um, he was introduced to me because he'd had an experience which he you know, thought I might be able to explain. Um, he was into none of this stuff, never heard of me, never heard of the reptilians or anything. But he had a, a partner who uh, lived, which is Brazilian. So he was in Brazil in 2009, I think it was. Yes, 2009. And um, he's out on his own painting the landscape in his own unique kind of way. He's got his easel and stuff, uh, and he's on his own and he's painting away in this landscape. And he said, then this came down in front of him. Bit of a surprise, I suppose. Um, and he said uh, it was... Uh, completely closed up apart from this window and there were two entities in the window and he said this thing came down and just stayed there for ages he said I don't know if I, I was taken aboard he said I have no recollection of it and of course he's got his bloody easel in front of him he starts painting it this chap um, and what he saw at the window were these reptilian type entities just staring at him looking at him um, and these entities exist I mean the, the what he has painted is also described and indeed painted by other people all over the world who've had the same ex basic experience of these entities. And I had to bloody smile um, that this year, the, the, the Daily Mail has been taking the piss out of me over this for ages, like all the other buggers, uh, and they run a perfectly straight story, headlined, Welcome to our new lizard overlord. Studies suggest alien worlds could be full of superintelligent dinosaurs. But because it's a scientist saying it, it must be bloody true. But Ike, he, he, he left school at 15, he can't be right, oh bloody hell. Now, what is also interesting about these uh, Gnostic writings is that they clearly 
were a, in many ways a blueprint for what became the, uh, a lot of the biblical writings, but they were distorted. A lot of things were, not, were, were removed that were in the, uh, the uh, Gnostic writings. And one of the things in these texts uh, says, the Lord Archon, Demiurge as they call it, um, come, let us create a man according to our image of God and according to our likeness that his image may become a light for us. And of course that became... Uh, a, a similarly biblical uh, uh, story, but distorted. Even the History Channel um, has had a series, Ancient Aliens, the series, and one of those uh, programs in that series was about all the ancient uh, descriptions of interbreeding between humans and non-humans to create hybrid bloodlines. And when we talk about interbreeding, because of what we talked about earlier, the nature of reality, doesn't mean some entity has to have sex with some human, um, nor does it even mean, it may do, but it doesn't even mean that there has to be some kind of genetic manipulation. There probably was, but it doesn't have to be, because if you can change the information blueprint at this level, then it comes through to the holographic level as a completely genetically different entity. Um, it's just an information change. So all these things are possible. But certainly they are... Uh, all over the ancient world, this is the most famous one, but all over the ancient world, there are descriptions of interbreeding between non-human entities and humans, creating hybrid bloodlines. Uh, this is uh, Genesis. Uh, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in under the unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And this is called the genetic disc. It was found in Colombia, which is estimated to be at least 6,000 years old, and um, on it are depicted human sperm, human uh, female eggs, the birth process, the whole shebang, fetuses. They knew that far back about all this stuff. Because in ancient society, there were high levels of awareness, not least because of these entities, but, but also be, uh, in, in the uh, pre-cataclysmic societies. And that got lost when the cataclysms brought an end to that, and people went back to basically a primitive society would actually build up again. And, of course, when you talk about the so-called fall of man, it's all connected to this, the fall into a lower uh, state of consciousness, I would suggest, um, then reptilian snakes seem to be involved in that. And what is also described is the genetic manipulation of the human form. Again, someone has, some people have uh, kind of decoded this uh, or expressed this as these entities created humans. Bollocks. No. What they did was change what already existed. It's absolutely in line with what the Gnostics talk about in terms of this archontic force. They changed what already existed. And they manipulated human genetics so we interacted with reality in a completely different way and became much more suppressed in terms of our ability to perceive reality. We no longer were the connected people of before and we got put in these bubbles of uh, sense of reality which has held in servitude ever since. Um, if you have harmony in the waveform level, then that will play through as harmony in the holographic world of the conscious mind. If you have a massive distortion in that level, it will play through as massive distortions in the holographic world of the conscious mind. A world now of war, people dying of hunger in a world of, of plenty, about me, 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 conflict on all bloody levels. All this came through from this distortion. They're all expressions of this distortion. And it allowed these entities from just outside of human perception, in frequency terms, to manipulate these, uh, this, this uh, reality that we experience as the world. And they are the force, this is absolutely crucial as we go along, these entities, and that which is an expression of these entities, are all worshipped in the end by all the major religions, people might like that who follow one, but all the major religions, I'll come into that as we go along. The secret societies, which are compartmentalized, um, they, at the highest inner core level, know 
that what these secret societies are worshipping are these entities, and Satanism, in its own enclosed secrecy, openly worships these entities and sacrifices people to these entities. This is, this, this is what sacrifice to the gods is all about in the ancient world. This. And behind the institutions of banking and politics, media, religion, and all of it, are these uh, entities through particular bloodlines that I will uh, talk about in a second, uh, which in the end all come back to the same force. Now, uh, you've got to see a lot of these, because if something is a force operating through all these different areas of society, ancient and modern, then the same themes are going to come through all those different things. And they do, as I'll show very clearly as we go through in this section. Common themes, here's one, worship of the reptile. Um, it's in our face, if you look at it. The oldest known, this is mainstream anthropology and stuff, the oldest known uh, focus of religious worship is the serpent or the snake. It goes back at least 70,000 years in the, to the Salido Hills in uh, Botswana, uh, where the sand people, also known as the Bushmen, say that the great python with his bag of eggs came and created uh, humanity. There's so much of symbolism to do with this stuff uh, around the world. And this is a man called the Reverend Bar Barthurst Dean. Obviously he was a Christian and he wrote a book called Worship of the Serpent, came out in 1933 and basically he did a study of worship of the serpent all over the world and why and where it went. And this was his conclusion. It appears then that no nations were so geographically remote or so religiously discordant, but that one and only one superstitious characteristic was common to all, that the most uh, civilized and the most barbarous bowed down with the same devotion to the same engrossing deity, and that this deity either was or was represented by the same sacred serpent. It appears also that in most, if not all, the civilized countries where the serpent was uh, worshipped, some fable or tradition which involved his history directly or indirectly alluded to the fall of man in paradise in which the serpent was concerned. What follows then, but that the most ancient account respecting the cause and nature of this seduction must be the one from which all the rest are derived, which represent the victorious serpent, victorious over man in a state of innocence and subduing his soul in a state of sin, as he would say as a Christian, into his most abject uh, veneration and adoration of himself. And you find reptilian entities depicted uh, all around the world, like these are found in graves of the Ubaid people, which preceded Sumer in what is now uh, uh, Iraq, Mesopotamia. The Egyptians used to um, depict their pharaohs in uh, the way of the cobra, with the, the, the cobra hood, the cobra belly, the cobra coming out of the third eye. Uh, the uh, Druids used to worship a serpent god called Hugh, which if you play it through, you man, it makes sense, uh, symbolically at least. Uh, in Asia, they had the Nagas, who were said to be a people who could take either human or reptilian form. You had uh, Kukul Khan, who was the serpent focus god of the Mayan people in Central America. Of course, you've got the dragon all over uh, Asia. You've got folk tales galore about dragons and flying dragons. And you've got the, the, the folklore and the fairy tales of, 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 of princes turning from fro frogs into princes and stuff like that. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the Paul VI audience hall in the bloody Vatican. There's old Ben. What the bloody hell is that, right? It's supposed to be... It's supposed to be, it's called the resurrection. It's supposed to be Jesus being resurrected. Bloody change since I last saw a picture. Not that they know what he looked like anyway. It didn't exist, but there you go. But so here then you have um, the way that the ancients in Mesopotamia and Babylon and such like, they, they represented uh, the, the serpent, uh, not the uh, fish gods rather, with, the, with the, uh, the scales, fish god worship. And the priests of the fish god cult, like the Dagon uh, fish god, etc., they used to wear hats like this that looked like a fish head. That's, that, you know... Um, and I'm saying, as I've said in my books over the years, these ancient religions came through is the Roman church and Christianity and other things. They're just the same ancient religions using different names to hide the fact that they're the same ancient religions. So there's the fish god cult of Babylon and there's the Roman church. Old Ben. 
And there's, um, there's the Archbishop of Canterbury with his fish at. You know, marrying the royal couple. It's just the same thing coming through the ages. They, they hide it. Uh, I'll have a pound of cod, please, Pope. <laughs> and some chips. There you go, there's your chips. Um, so, um, it'll be, no. Oh, think of the sponsorship potential, Ben. So, this is a great friend of mine, Credo Muchwa. He's in his 90s now, from uh, South Africa. I met him in 1998 uh, when he called me and said, how do you know about the Chittahuri? What the hell is the Chittahuri? People, uh, the children of the serpent. It's, it's uh, the Zulu uh, ancient uh, lore and legends of the Chittahuri, reptilian entities manipulating human affairs. This is uh, one species, because there are many of these reptilian entities, which Credo um, uh, painted, because he's, you know, he's an artist and a great talented man. Uh, interestingly, when you put that next to Robert Ilomis' uh, painting from 2009, that's much, much older, in a totally different society, the, I mean, the, the similarities are compelling. And this is the, uh, the necklace of the mysteries. It's been stolen now, unfortunately, but I've seen it many times before it was. Credo Mutua had this passed down as a, in the shamanistic stream. It's mentioned in accounts 500 years old. He reckons it's at least 1,000. And here you have... Um, the symbols hanging from, it's not a necklace really, it, it goes on the shoulder, it's extremely heavy. And the shaman goes around these symbols and tells the story of African history and indeed world history. And on the front is a very non-human entity with a, with, with, uh, in come and get me mode. And, um, and here is a human woman. And this hundreds at least years of uh, old uh, artifact, uh, that symbol is about the interbreeding between the non-human race and, uh, and humans to create this hybrid uh, bloodline. And there's more symbols on there, which I'll come to later. And I asked him, I said, well, it doesn't look very reptilian. And, and he, he told a story that I found around the world in different cultures, that this, this reptilian uh, force, this Chittahuri, as they call them, said, you never depict us as we really look. So some people did, but many people didn't. They just depicted them as completely unhuman, but not like, um, not like they really looked. Now this is a big time important thing in relation to the world that we live in today and, and what controls it, who controls it. Because the ancient accounts again talk, and I've talked to people on the inside in the modern world who've confirmed all this from their perspective, that certain bloodlines were created to specifically represent these entities outside of human uh, society, outside of human frequency range, in the human frequency range of visible light to be the manipulators in our world of that which is manipulating our world. Because for, for vibrational and atmospheric reasons, they cannot come into our world except very briefly or in technology which gives them a, um, a manufactured atmosphere, a manufactured reality in which they can, they can come. In other words, they need representatives that are operating with invisible light to manipulate our world. That's what these bloodlines are. And, um, they see DNA as a software program. They know what it is. They know the body's a biological computer. And they want to keep certain information patterns within this DNA because it, it uh, dictates the behavior of these hybrid bloodlines. And they want to control them as much as they control anyone else. And so to keep this bloodline pure, in other words, to keep the software program intact, these bloodlines through the ages, we know, known as royal bloodlines, aristocratic bloodlines, have interbred incessantly with each other. Because if they bred outside of this particular hybrid uh, uh, software, it would quickly become diluted and no longer have the information patterns that dictate their behavior, which I'll come to. Uh, in fact, I'll come to it now. One of the great traits of these bloodlines is that they have deleted from them the ability for empathy. Empathy is the fail-safe mechanism of human society, or any society. If we have empathy with the consequences for others of our actions, that fundamentally uh, dictates our actions and suppresses the extreme nature of our actions. If you have no ability to empathize 
with the uh, consequences for others of your actions, there are now no limits. There is nothing you wouldn't do because there is no emotional consequence of doing it. Indeed, you can get off on it, as some of these do. And these, in the modern world, are what those bloodlines look like today. They've come through history, and now they're the ones in the positions of power in banking, business, media ownership, politics, uh, corporate, uh, uh, massive uh, corporate giants around the world in big biotech, big uh, pharma, uh, big food, and all the rest of it. And they are the representatives within visible light of these archontic, I will call them, because they take various forms, entities. And they are shapeshifters, or the most extreme of them can be. Not all of them uh, that, I've, that were on that picture, but the more extreme of them can be. And people say, that Ike is another one on the list. He says people can shapeshift. That's ridiculous. Well, if you're coming from your perspective of reality that everything is solid, that is bloody ridiculous. But as I talked about in part one, this is not a solid world. It's a holographic world. The solidity is illusory, as quantum physics will confirm. And the shift in shape is not a physical solidity shift. It is a shift in the information waveform information field. So, if there's a shift in the information field at the waveform level, then it will be decoded through the uh, genetic brain decoding system through to a holographic shift. In other words, the shift takes place in the observer's decoding system. One minute the person is looking human because that is decoding the human field. Then there's a shift in that field and another field which is not human will become the dominant one. That decoding system is now decoding the second field. To the observer, there has been a physical shift from human to non-human and back again, but what this actually been is a shift in the information fields the observer is decoding. And thus, we see people, he's not there by accident either, these, um, we see these people here with invisible light, and they look human. But if you could see beyond it, deeper into the energy field, you would see something that's anything but human. And these uh, Gnostic writings found at Nag Hammadi uh, talk about the fact that one of the great ways that these archontic entities manipulate human society and human perception is by being mind parasites, by what we call possessing or influencing the human mind to think, perceive and act in certain negative ways. So one of the key reasons that these particular bloodlines were created was because if you have genetic compatibility here in the holographic realm, then when you go back to the base construct, the vibrational realm, you have vibrational compatibility, or much greater, and therefore the ability to possess that uh, uh, body-mind and influence it and dictate its perceptions and behavior becomes much more powerful than the general run of the human population in which that uh, genetic compatibility is not as close. Uh, of course, possession is an ancient, as long as history, uh, uh, theme right up to the present day. Now, I talk to a lot of visual psychics around the world. I mean, I've been on this road nearly a quarter of a century. I've had a chance to talk to a few. And, and they uh, often talk, tell me about seeing uh, ethereal type entities, often reptilian in form, locking into these lower two chakra points and kind of floating around. This is part of the way that they possess. And then I'm, I'm reading an article about this visual psychic, a Swiss bloke, um, who, who seems to be you know, very renowned at what he does. And he wasn't talking about any of this stuff. He was just talking about his life and what he experienced and things that he's experienced. And in the middle of this article, he said this, a guy called Anton Steiger. When I see people in business or politics who are particularly trapped by the material world, shoom, five senses, for example, I notice that they no longer have any light bodies at all. Uh, in many of these people, the point of light at the heart chakra, which is otherwise always present, is no longer visible to me. What do we call these people like bankers? They are heartless. Literally true on an energetic level. Instead, I see something like a layer of shiny tar around them. 
in which a monstrous being in the shape of a lizard can be distinguished. When such people speak on television, for example, I see a co crocodile shape manifesting itself around the person like in a concave mirror. I don't see the light of their throat or forehead chakra. These, this is the possession, this is the mind parasite nature of these entities that the uh, Gnostics talked about. Now, lots of people send me stuff from around the world because I, what I talk about. And I got sent this. I'm not saying that this is real. It might be a trick of the light. But it does give a visual feel for the way so many of these people have been described to me. Um, with the um, eyes changing from a human pupil to a reptilian pupil and then going back again. I've heard that, you know, I've seen, uh, people have given me endless accounts of full body shifts, uh, shifts uh, of the upper body and, and more than anything shifts of the eyes. The eyes are the window on the soul or the window to the, the self beyond the world that we see. And interestingly, I've got a, a friend who has an associate who has, um, was doing a research into, I mean, I don't agree with it, but he's doing research into um, iris scanning technology. And this uh, 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 led to him looking through a microscope into, I think it was 2,300 eyes or pairs of eyes. And what he said, he, I mean, he had no idea that my friend was associated with me, he probably had no idea I exist. But what he said to my friend was this, um, of the 2,300 eyes that he scanned, around 4% appeared to be of reptilian type and appearance and he could not understand what the hell that was all about. And if someone said, you know, what is the percentage of the human population? I'd say 4 or 5% that is what I'm talking about. That's, that's how few it takes to manipulate the world if you get hold of the institutions that dictate the world. So we're looking at people from a visible light point of view that look human but beyond that are not. Um, there you go. He doesn't have to shapeshift Murdoch, does he? I mean, bloody hell. A bit like, a bit like Mick Jagger. He doesn't have to, does he, really? But um, there you go. There's one of them. He doesn't look... Uh, he, he looks perfectly human. Oh, there we go. There's another one. There you go. There you go. Ooh, there you go. Been to the ritual, Mom? Have you heard what's going on? And, and, and the other thing is that these, these bloodlines, they, like I've just said, they stay in, inside the, the network. And so that you, when you f follow them back, you tend to come across some interesting people. We've had Prince Charles in the last few months um, talking about the uh, royal family's uh, uh, ancestral connection to uh, Vlad the Impaler, one of the most infamous blood-drinking, satanic torturers in human history, who was a member, along with the rest of his family, of something in its, in its uh, simple title called the Order of the Dragon which goes back into the ancient world, which is an order of these bloodlines. Um, and uh, he was from Transylvania, and old Charles has got a place there. Mary of Tech, the, uh, her grandmother, uh, was connected uh, ge uh, genetically very closely down the line to his sister, and thus brought that bloodline into the royal family. There you go. They're not what we think they are. That's the point. And um, because we only see the visible light level, it seems fantastic. Uh, I think, you know, one of the great, well, no, I'll rephrase that. The only good thing, from my point of view, of the Diamond Jubilee celebrations was when, at the royal concert, Elton John sang Crocodile Rock to the royal family. I thought that was absolutely frickin' brilliant. Um, and... Like I say, these bloodlines have no empathy, therefore they have no limits. Pepper bombing, cities full of civilians, couldn't give a damn. Starving people to death, putting mercenaries into countries to cause mayhem, as in uh, city, uh, countries in the middle and near east and North Africa, not a problem. What a laugh, no empathy. Another thing is that a lot of people don't realize that one of the fundamentally important influences of human perception and behavior is called the R-complex by scientists, or the reptilian brain. And the reptilian brain, um, when not balanced by other parts of the brain, gives us cold-blooded behavior and territoriality, a desire to control, an obsession with ritualistic behavior. These are so ritualistic, these, these bloodlines. Everything is ritual to them. Um, and hierarchical structures of power. Aggression, might is right, winner takes all. I've just described human society has dictated by the crazies. And all this stuff 
in the royal family, all this royal protocol, all this ritual, is all reptilian brain. And if you have a greater infusion of reptilian genetics, you're going to have a greater extreme of reptilian characteristic traits. I mean, did you see that after the royal wedding, when Madam issues another list to update who should bow and curtsy to bloody who? I mean, what a joke. The last I looked, it was the 21st century. Where are we? What's going on? If he falls anymore, he'll fall over. And we call them the British royal family. No, they're not. They're the German, Danish, Greek, Russian, and anything else involved royal family. Same with all the others around bloody Europe. Same bloody family. And, um, oh no, they're only symbolic now and for ceremonial purposes. Bollocks. She talks about my government. Why? Because that, that is what it is. She talks about my parliament. It's my military, my MI5, my MI6, my courts, my church. All the people in those organizations, including the representatives of the people, have to uh, uh, say a, a, a pledge of allegiance, an oath of allegiance to her, not the people. It's a bloody joke. And... Um, this idea that it's symbolic, rubbish, rubbish. I mean, when you meet the Prime Minister, whoever it is, are you supposed to bow or curtsy? No, but he is to her. Where's the power here? I mean, I, what a joke. Look at him. I mean, <laughs> do you know, I, I feel sad really because these people, they go off to wars and, you know, put themselves in bloody danger. I don't agree they should because they put other people in bloody danger at all as well, called children and people. But, I mean, what are you, what, oh my God, beam me up, Scotty, it's mad down here, get me out, I've had enough. And then there's this royal bloody household that we're paying for. Did you know that there's a gold stick and a silver stick on the royal household? At least they have metallic value, that's a, probably a good thing. There's a groom of the stole, there's a field officer in brigade waiting, He's always walking up and down, looking pissed off, looking at his watch. <laughs> He'd be a lot better using his time, keeping an eye on that groom of the stole before he nicks something else, I think. And then, they've got a clerk of the closet. And even worse, they've got a deputy clerk of the closet. <laughs> what do they do? Pull the chain? Is it the raw flush? What do they do? Hello, mate, what do you do? Oh, I'm a deputy clerk of the closet. No, don't piss about. What do you do? Um, then there's a... Re they used to have a removing wardrobe. At least they got rid of him. Removing wardrobe. What do you do? You... I remove wardrobes, yeah. Do you ever bring them back? Oh, no, bring back wardrobe does that. I mean, oh, bloody hell. We're paying for this. The British royal family, proof that God has a sense of humour, that's my, my view anyway. Now, why, what, what is the d dynamic here with these bloodlines? Well, uh, like I said, they operate with invisible light on behalf of entities that operate outside of visible light. And if you take the analogy of the scientist standing outside the tank, working inside the tank through the gloves with material that's too dangerous to work with, you take the tank to be our reality, the scientists to be these entities and the gloves to be these bloodlines that allow them to manipulate within this reality, that's the basic dynamic of why they exist and what they're doing. This is Neil Haig's depiction here of, of, the, of the theme. Uh, and thus these entities have their own agenda and uh, it's not the human agenda for what's best for humans, it's what's best for the agenda of control of humans. And if you take the uh, Trojan horse analogy and you put that on, then you've pretty much got what it is. It's infiltration of human society while appearing not to be infiltrating because everyone looks human, but only with invisible light. Now here's the journey of these bloodlines. You can pick it up at some point through history, it goes way back. Let's pick it up here. Um, these societies, these more advanced societies, Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, China, etc., they started to appear as the first more advanced societies uh, after the cataclysm. What history does is pick up uh, the, the cradle of civilization in places like Sumer and what have you. That wasn't the cradle of civilization. These societies were when 
human society had reached a certain point again after recovering from the great cataclysmic events that destroyed the previous society, much more advanced. Um, in this area of the world, Sumer, which is now, of course, Iraq, became Babylon, why there's so much Babylon symbolism uh, in human society today, Egypt. Um, a lot of the bloodlines uh, came from here, but they were seeded all over the world. And they talked about entities interbreeding with humans and creating uh, royal bloodlines and, and what have you in um, various uh, tablets found in, um, in Iraq, under, under Iraq in the last century or so. And these bloodlines moved out into northern Europe. They, they became the founders of Rome and they interbred with other bloodlines in Europe and they became the European royal families and aristocracy. And eventually, through the great British Empire, the French Empire, great only in size, by the way, in my view, uh, uh, and other European empires, they sent these bloodlines all over the world in the great colonial frenzy of uh, taking the planet over. Um, but there, there's two types of control. One has a finite life, one has an infinite life until it's exposed. The one that has a finite life is when you, like fascism, communism, uh, apartheid, that which is subject to the control can see the controllers. Because eventually, it might take some time, there will be a rebellion against that. The greatest form of control is control you can't see, where they give you a vote every four or five years, and yet behind the scenes, the same people are in power behind the scenes all the time, no matter who's officially in power in, uh, in politics. And that's what they did in the colonial uh, system. They apparently withdrew back into their countries and gave independence to the former colonies like the United States and Canada and, and etc. around the world. But what they did was left out in those countries the bloodline under different names and the secret society network through which they manipulate the bloodline and its agents into power and they've gone on covertly controlling those countries um, ever since. And what they've created is a secret society and bloodline version of a transnational corporation. What uh, happens with a transnational corporation? Take McDonald's, please. Take, take McDonald's, if you, uh, if you will, as far as you can. Um, but take McDonald's as an example. They have a headquarters in America, and in each country they have subsidiaries. And the subsidiaries carry out the diktats of the headquarters and thus, if you go into a McDonald's in Russia or Australia or South Africa or wherever, you go into basically the same McDonald's. What they've done with the uh, Bloodline Global Network is they have a headquarters. Funnily enough, America is very, very influential, but the headquarters is in Europe. It's in places like the city of London, Rome, um, Brussels, Berlin, etc., uh, Paris. And from the center, they um, have subsidiaries in the different countries. These are subsidiary networks of bloodlines under different names and the secret society network um, within that country. And that network's um, uh, brief or job is to impose in their sphere of influence, their country, what is centrally dictated from the headquarters. Thus, as I've traveled around the world, I've seen the same things being introduced in, in different countries around the same time, often justified by the same excuses. And it even goes further, because the national um, network has subsidiaries in the towns, cities, and communities. And thus, um, from the headquarters, they can manipulate down into a local community, uh, if they wish, through this uh, network. Um, and they've created this structure in which they have not just infiltrated but created the organizations that run uh, and control the direction of the world. I get into some of them. But what the vast overwhelming majority of researchers into this conspiracy do not see or do not want to go there is the fact that there comes a point where this human network goes up into or out into other dimensions of reality and the dictating force is not human. And common themes. Uh, the number of times you see around the world depictions in different societies of half human, half reptile um, entities. This is in, uh, obviously in, uh, in Asia. 
and the depiction of the interaction between reptilian agents in humans and part human, part something else. The gargoyles on the, the churches built by these secret societies, like the Knights Templar, along the castles and, and ma mansions of the uh, elite bloodlines, they are uh, symbolically uh, uh, these entities. Uh, so many of the coats of arms of these bloodlines uh, carry reptilian themes. Uh, the uh, whole logo of the city of London, or Babby London, as I call it, because it's one of the great central focuses of uh, control, uh, not, not only through finance either, um, is a reptilian holding the red cross and the white background of the Knights Templar, one of the major secret societies in this network. Uh, one of the key points in London, uh, for this conspiracy uh, anyway, where the city of London meets uh, Temple, or Temple Bar, or the Temple uh, region, which is the, the, the legal profession and courts, is this flying reptile um, on a pedestal right in the middle of the road. They put these things everywhere. Now, there's another common theme, this is all over the world, of reptilian-type entities eating humans. Um, there's so many of them, it's unbelievable. This is Central American, as the previous one was. Um, here's some more, and often they'll put a crown on the top because this is the royal bloodline. This is where the divine right to rule comes from, or the idea of it. It's the, it's the belief that you have the right to rule because of your genetic descendants from these gods, the divine right to rule. Uh, there again, a similar one. Here's uh, other ones and logos and coats of arms and, 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 and what have you. And there's Alfa Romeo, uh, uh, the same, and of course the red cross and the white background of the Knights Templar. You see this reptilian theme coming up a lot in, um, in entertainment because these bloodlines and their networks control Hollywood and they control uh, the entertainment industry in general. This is an advert, a Nike advert, where this American footballer was depicted as reptilian and the theme of it was because of that he was better than anybody else. Uh, and at the end of the thriller video, uh, when Michael Jackson turned around, they were reptilian eyes. They could have been lots of different eyes, but they were reptilian. And this happens because of what I said earlier, all these different things are worshipping the same basic uh, force and thus this symbolism of this force appears in all these different areas, not just these, also banking and politics and stuff. Now, a lot of these uh, bloodlines are Satanists, in fact the major ones are all Satanists. And by that I mean they are into human sacrifice, human blood drinking and all that, all this, all that other stuff, the sacrifice of children. And it's been going on way back. And people have no problem with the fact that it was going, oh yeah, those ancients used to do that, and the Aztecs and all that stuff. But they can't expand that perception of the possible that it's still going on. It is massively going on. The fact is it was openly going on then. Then it became unacceptable to the population in general, and it's gone on uh, secretly ever since. Um, and what, I've talked to a lot of Satanists, uh, former Satanists, and I guess former Satanists, who've told me uh, uh, common themes about what goes on in these, uh, in these rituals. And, you know, uh, they, uh, these entities are feeding off human energy. And one of the things that they do is when they're sacrificing somebody, the, the people with invisible light, the Satanists and the bloodlines, they'll drink the blood because uh, when the terror reaches a certain point in the ritual, a certain adrenaline goes in the blood, which gives these people a high. I mean, sick is not the word. But on another level, an energetic level, the entities are feeding off the energy coming off of terror and fear of the, um, of the sacrifice. And the other thing that they tell me happens in these rituals is they create an energetic environment, like a stepping stone energy environment, where these entities can come through and manifest, not for long, but for a while. Common themes. Now this is David Berkowitz. He went to uh, jail for the son of Sam serial killings in New York. And after he was jailed, he said, he corresponded with a Christian minister, and he said, yeah, um, I did it, but I did it as part of a satanic coven, a satanic cult that arranged it all for me, and I was just the guy who did it. And uh, he said at one point in this correspondence, Satanists are peculiar people. They aren't ignorant peasants or semi-literate natives. Rather, their ranks are filled with doctors, lawyers, businessmen, and basically highly responsible citizens. They are not a careless group or are apt to make mistakes, but they are secretive and bonded together by a common need and desire to mete out havoc on society. It was Alistair Crowley who said, um, 
Uh, I want uh, blasphemy, murder, rape, revolution, anything bad. What does that do? It pulls uh, uh, that energy that they feed off, but it also pulls people into low vibrational states of awareness. And the two major colors of Satanism, for frequency reasons, are black. Uh, black is the absence of light and absorbs light in all frequencies, and red, which is the lowest, longest frequency color. And there you see red and black dominating royal protocol, along with gold, which is another color they use, um, Satanists, uh, uh, in, in this, this ritual that goes on. And I, I saw this. I had to go back to the original BBC coverage and, and watch the video to make sure this wasn't a Photoshop job, and it wasn't. Um, this is at the royal wedding with uh, William, and uh, there's a satanic symbol on the back of this bloody clergyman meeting the queen, a reverse pentagram. I mean, it's bloody... Uh, ridiculous, but it's not when you realize that the religions are just public uh, expressions of a much deeper and more horrific inner core. Uh, I mean, look at Christianity. Its very focus of attention is someone being tortured. What are you doing? A focus on that. And that, for reasons I'll come to, has an effect on people and uh, the wider reality. And you have the Eucharist in the, in the Roman church. And what are they doing? They're eating the flesh and drinking the blood. That's just a publicly acceptable version of what goes on uh, on the inside, literally. I mean, what, 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 what is it when you, when you reduce your deity to the level of a biscuit? I mean, <laughs> is it me? I mean, if you're going to do that, I'll at least make it a bloody hobnob. That's what I say. Because they're good for dipping. There you go, he's getting in the spirit of it now, look. You know it makes sense. So, th this is the key to understand so much. Also, politics, banking, media ownership and stuff, in the end, worships that. This is a quote from a Swiss banker in the Russian magazine Novi Den in 2011. These people are corrupt, talking of bank the bankers. They are sick in their minds, so sick they're full of vices, and those vices are kept under wraps on their orders. Many are uh, into Satanism. When you go into some banks, uh, you see these Satanistic symbols, like in the Rothschild Bank in Zurich. These people are controlled by blackmail because of the weaknesses they have. They have to uh, follow orders or they will be exposed, they will be destroyed, even killed. This pervades society. What, are, what do you see from the banking industry? Total lack of empathy with the victims their actions. And so, when I've, over the years, uh, investigated and followed through major people involved in pushing the direction of the world, I have found three absolutely repeating themes with them. One, secret societies. Two, Satanism. Three, very topical at the moment, paedophilia. And they connect together in reasons I'll come to. Now, this is Bohemian Grove in Northern California, where um, the uh, high and mighty elite in politics, banking, uh, banking and business and all the rest of it in, in America, and wider afield, go to this uh, summer camp at Bohemian Grove uh, in, in uh, Northern California and they worship under a 40-foot stone owl symbolic of an ancient deity called Moloch uh, and, and they do sacrifices and stuff in smaller areas in this great area of Bohemian Grove 2,700 acres of Redwood Forest and uh, all these people like the Bushes and the Clinton and, and uh, the Rockefellers and all this Kissinger and all these people go along and people come from abroad as well. Um, and, and we're seeing Satanism more and more pushed and infiltrated into human society to become more and more acceptable. This is Lady Bloody Gaga, crikey, her mother must have been psychic, um, uh, pushing the old, you know, Satanism blood stuff. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm not saying, you know, Annie Lennox is into all this stuff, but what I'm, I'm saying is that the, 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 the uh, ceremonies of, uh, the, at the Olympics, the opening and closing ceremonies and stuff, was, if, you, if you know what you're looking for, was incredibly satanic in its uh, symbolism, some of which I'll get to. Then you've got this, this Twilight series. Let's make vampires kind of sexy now. 
Then you have the Harry Potter thing. I mean, one of the Harry Potter books was called The Half-Blood Prince. Spot on. That's what it's about. And Slytherin House and all this stuff. And all this esoteric occult stuff um, going into the, the young mind on a, on, a, on a massive level. This is all done on purpose. And what are we coming up to it now? Halloween, when I was a kid, just passed you by. Now it's this great festival where they're bringing kids into it. Always oh, Halloween, trick and treat, and all that stuff. And they're making it a kind of mini bloody Christmas. And it's pulling people in. If people only realized that at this time, particularly, and at Beltane across May the 1st, staggering numbers of children on this planet are being sacrificed by these people and others around the world. That's the real meaning of Halloween and Beltane, not trick or treat. And uh, this whole energy stuff very much connects into Satanism. Because as I mentioned, these entities outside of human sight, they feed off human energy. It's one of their power sources. But it's a particular human energy. It's a very simple frequency physics uh, situation. If you are within a certain frequency band yourself, you are only going to uh, um, absorb energy within that frequency band. Anything outside that frequency band is going to go through you like radio stations go through radio stations. Thus, you need to generate energy within a frequency band that you can absorb. What is the frequency band in human terms of these entities? Low vibrational human emotion around the basic state of fear. And so they're generating human fear, anxiety, frustration, anger, uh, hatred, all of it, because it's generating the energy that they absorb, their, their life force in so many ways. In the Matrix, they had the, the machines symbolically feeding off human energy. That's what these entities do. And thus, um, if you go back to the Dr. Emoto stuff with the, the crystals in the, in the water, uh, the, the crystals with um, words of love written on the side of the water before they were frozen um, are beautiful, geometrical, uh, beautiful to the eye. That energy is unabsorbable by these entities. It's, it's on a frequency they simply cannot sync with because of their state of being. This is what they want. They want this energy. And thus they have created and structured human society to become a factory, an engine room, a generator of this energy. A war is a banquet to these people because of all the energy that's created by those doing it, those receiving it, and the impacts on lives as a result of it. And uh, look at the, the way the human society is devastated in terms of its balance, its harmony, its joy by reasons for low vibrational, distorted emotional responses. And uh, this is a key reason why humans were manipulated from a heart society to a emotional gut reaction society. Because there, nothing served for dinner, darlings. Here, much as you like. And um, people think that um, human energy is not important. There are sensors around the world that are picking up changes in the Earth's energy field. This is what happened on 9-11 as a result of humanity's response to what it was witnessing. And that is the power that collective humanity has on the human energy field. If you can manipulate humans into a negative response, understandably, to things like 9-11, you massively impact on the vibrational energetic state of the Earth's energy field, and it's the energy sea that we are living in all the time. If you want to get to all the fish at the same time, what do you do? You get to the sea, and then you get all the fish. And the energy sea that we are living in all the time is what they're targeting all the time. And so when we react to their heartless uh, corruption and oppression in this way, I'm going to get into this seriously in, part, in the last part today, 
um, then we are actually giving them what they want. Because we are reacting in ways that are generating more of the energy on which they feed. This is a Native American basic American concept story. Uh, that in each of us there are two wolves they talk about. One wolf is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority and ego. The other wolf is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion and faith. Which wolf wins? The Native Americans say the one you feed the most. Now, I'm not saying humans are perfect and do not have the capacity for that. But what the Gnostics talk about in their writings is that what the uh, archontic force is doing is taking minor error and it is distorting it and expanding it into massive violations of these emotions and massive expansions and extremes of these emotions. So, this is what they are trying to generate with their mind parasite uh, modus operandi, etc. Uh, in humans, because that's their life force. They are energetic vultures. The Matrix had this concept with Morpheus and the battery. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. Symbolically, that is absolutely the case. And George Carlin, George Carlin said this interestingly, did you ever stop to think about all the people we kill they're always the people who tell us to live together in harmony and try to love one another. Gandhi, Lincoln, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, John Lennon. They all said, try to live peacefully together. Bam, right in the head. Apparently we're not ready for that. Oh, we're ready for it. But that which is manipulating us does not want us to have it. There was a, an Australian document came to light a few years ago. I, I printed it in full in a book called Human Race, Get Off Your Knees. It appears to come from a quite a high level um, Australian Satanist who wrote this before he died. Um, and it was not, a, was not a confession so much as this is, this is what's going on, this is how it is. And he talked about many things, but he also talked about the fact that what Satanism does is it constantly targets the Earth's energy field at specific points to repeatedly do rituals there which lower the vibration of the Earth's energy field. Again, the sea that we're interacting with to push us down into the same low vibrational state. This is what he said in the document. Most people do not realize that Satanism is a ritually based practice and that this repetition has, over time, left strong impressions upon the morphic field, the energy field, the sea that I talk about. Now, this is massively, massively important. It's going to take us into some really weird and wonderful places. The language of symbolism. Why are these symbols, recurring symbols, that I'm going to go through, why are they all around us? Well, I'm going to get to the point of why, and it's very deep in the rabbit hole that we go in here. But what are symbols? This is why it's so vital to understand at least the basics of the nature of reality to understand the conspiracy. Um, Confucius said, signs and symbols rule the world, not words nor laws. Nor... So why? This is why. A symbol is again a symbol in the holographic world, bring it down to its basic state, it is a vibrational information field. A symbol communicates information to the brain through the eyes in the same way as the ear communicates uh, audible visual um, words and sound to the brain as an information field. The difference is that when you hear something, at least you're aware of its existence. It is conscious. When a symbol talks to us through the eyes to the brain, it is subliminal. Therefore, sublim symbols are planting information fields and vibrational states into the human subconscious 
which then come through to influence conscious perception and conscious behavior. Also, if a symbol represents something, whatever it is, if you focus your attention on that symbol, you are making an energetic connection with what that symbol represents because what it represents and the symbol, as I'll come to, will be the same frequency field. And thus, symbolism is the, one of the greatest ways that we are mentally and emotionally uh, manipulated and encoded and perceptionally manipulated. There's a great saying, it's true, energy flows where attention goes. Somebody said to me, other people have had this experience, they said they were in a restaurant, you know, sitting at the table, and they said, I, I felt like two eyes were sticking in me back. And he, he said, I turned around, and there's this person at this other table behind them, staring at them. Now, of course, they weren't feeling two eyes sticking in their back. What they were feeling energetically, which eventually filtered through to the holographic level of feeling, was the attention of the person staring at them. Energy flows where attention goes. So thus, if you can hijack someone's attention, collectively or individually, you are hijacking their energy and their life force. Energy flows where attention goes. Now, in the Olympics, I heard um, British athlete after British athlete during the London Olympics that was successful saying that they got this amazing energetic surge from the crowd. This is why people doing sport among their own supporters have a great advantage. Because as these athletes were competing in the London Games, overwhelmingly watched by uh, British people, the focus of attention, willing them to win, was um, making an energetic connection to these people and thus energizing them. Energy flows where attention goes, but it goes the other way. And if you get a crowd of people focusing on symbols of the conspiracy and symbols representing these entities without us knowing, then that crowd, whether it's the Queen or whatever, are making an energetic uh, attention connection to those entities. Thus, their energy can be trawled. A crowd can have fantastic energy. If you go to a football match, you know, with a great excitement, and what do people say? Honestly, mate, the airs on the back of your neck stood up. It was amazing. What was that? Electromagnetic energy generated by the crowd. That's what these people absorb. Same with uh, the Vatican with these great crowds which focus on the bloody Pope and the ritual and the symbols. Same with the symbol infested by the entertainment industry these days with people like Madonna. And when you get people like focusing on a religious symbol, you know, look at the bloody energy that that would create and be able to be trawled. And when you get and focus like five days a week. I'm not having to go at one religion. I mean, you know, they're all the same to me. And I respect people's right to believe what they want to believe. But I have my right to, to believe what I want to believe as well. That's the deal. And, um, um, and uh, when you're focusing your attention like that, energy flows where attention goes. And thus, um, you have these... Uh, secret societies, they're also involved in energy trawling. And that brings me to this, which also goes into this, for reasons I'll come to. That um, energy, that uh, Satanist in uh, Australia talked about the you know, abuse of children and, 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 and what have you. And what, what is happening, and, 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 and the reason for it, is that these entities operating outside of human sight, we'll call them archontic, they feed off human energy, yes, but there's a particular energy they want more than anything else, and that's the energy of children before puberty. We see puberty here as a hormonal change. You go back to the base construct, 
and it is a vibrational change which holographically expresses itself as hormonal change. These entities want that energy before the energy change happens. Therefore, they want the energy of prepubescent children. And how do they get it? They, through genetic reasons, because there's a lot of genetic paedophilia, <coughs> but also through energy, oh, sorry, energy, what am I saying sorry to you? Uh, well, uh, you exist. You're part of all that is this. Of course I'll say sorry to you. Sorry, mate. You're right. <laughs> I, I'm sure you'll see things from another angle eventually. Yeah. But anyway, what, what, um, what, what I was saying, yes, the, um, they also energetically stimulate the desire for uh, sex with children. Because what they're doing with the paedophilia is they're using the paedophile as the conduit to draw off the life force of the child. <clears throat> and that's why you find, as my research has shown over the years, a far higher ratio of paedophilia to these so-called elite levels in Satanism than you find in the general population. This is what a Central American shaman called Don Juan Matas said um, <clears throat> in a book by Carlos Castaneda some years ago. Sorcerers see infant human beings as strange luminous balls of energy covered from the top to the bottom with a glowing coat, something like a coat of plastic adjusted tightly around a cocoon of energy. The glowing coat of awareness is what the predators consume and when a human reaches, uh, reached adulthood, all that is left in that fringe of awareness is a narrow fringe that goes from the ground to the top of the toes. That fringe permits mankind to keep on living, but only uh, barely. So like I say, they're using the paedophile as the conduit to draw off the child's life force. That's what paedophilia is about, and that's why it's so prevalent, and that's why it's so incredibly prevalent in the institutional bloodline levels of society. And this uh, Australian Satanist said, uh, politicians, <coughs> massive Satanism in politics um, around the world, uh, politicians are introduced by a carefully graded set of criteria and situations that enable them to accept that their victims will be our little secret. Young children sexually abused, molested rather, and physically abused by politicians worldwide are quickly used as sacrifices. In Australia, the bodies are hardly ever discovered for Australia is still a wilderness. In the other parts of the world, they, can, they control the, the uh, crematoria and the great burial grounds around the world as well. And so I was not in the least bit surprised about him because I was told about him in the late 1990s that he was into uh, massive paedophilia and necrophilia, sex with dead bodies, which has just come out this week through a guy uh, who, uh, who talked about it on the radio. And, and the reason that he, Jimmy Savile, this uh, entertainer who died in 2011, the reason he got away with it was because he was a procurer of children for the rich and famous. And he was very, very close to the British royal family. In fact, in his own words, he was introduced to the royal family by Louis, Lord Louis Mountbatten, who some researchers have connected to paedophilia in places like the King Cora Children's Home in, in Belfast. He, Edward Heath, who, the Prime Minister 7074, who took us into the, um, what is now the European Union, I named him as not just a paedophile, but a Satanist and serial child killer seven years before he died. And he did nothing about it, because it's true. This guy, um, Thomas Hamilton, the killer of the children in Dunblane in 1996, he was a procurer of children for the rich and famous. That's why he uh, was protected for so long. And that's why, in the official inquiry into what he did, some of the documents were put under lock and key, never to be seen, it was said, for a hundred bloody years. Even a former um, head of um, Freemasons in, in uh, Scotland, uh, Lord Burton, said the Dunblane inquiry was a cover-up and that he was bullied when he tried to question it. And uh, this very week, about two days ago, an MP uh, raised in the House of Commons uh, a question about um, paedophilia rings out of, out of number 10. Uh, I've been naming this guy, uh, the President of the United States, uh, George, Father George Bush, as a paedophile and child killer since the 1990s. Said it in radio, said it on the BBC, didn't make the podcast mine, but I've uh, been saying it for years. It almost came out in, uh, in this story in 1989, but then was, was put on, on hold and, and, and suppressed. And of course, the Roman Church, which is an expression of these bloodlines going way back, Church of Babylon relocated, um, is infamous for paedophilia. This is the reason why. 
That's why you see uh, naked children all over uh, the, the Vatican when you go around. And what, what, what are demons doing in a sporting event ceremony uh, around kids in hospital beds? Can you explain that to me? I thought that was bloody weird. What, what, what? What is the child catcher in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang bloody doing in a sporting event opening ceremony? I tell you, it was alive with symbolism, that was. And, and I've been saying for years that these bloodlines drink the blood of children to rejuvenate themselves, and that's one major reason why they live so long. Queen Mother, 102. Uh, Prince Philip in his uh, 90s. Uh, uh, David Rockefeller, 97. Uh, Henry Kissinger almost in his 90s. They, they, they live for so long. One reason is they get different treatment to us, but this is another. And this uh, <clears throat> came out only the other day that they've now found the amazing discovery, shaman in the ancient world have known it for thousands of years, that transfusions of young blood appear to rejuvenate the elderly. That's why they live for so long. Um, common themes. The eye. I'm going to whip through these now because uh, we've got, still got a lot to get through in this uh, um, in this section because of the way that all these, this information fits together. The eye, the all-seeing eye, the single eye or the pyramid of eye, an eye, is a major symbol of these bloodlines going way back and that's why it appears everywhere in all these institutions. The eye of Ra or Horus. It was on the, uh, the hand on the uh, necklace of the mysteries of Credo Muchwa in the Zulu world. This was uh, found in uh, 1984 in Ecuador um, by miners, I think, digging for gold. There's the eye, there's 13 levels, and this is thousands of years old. And when you um, put it into, uh, under ultraviolet light, it even glows luminous from the eye. Where is it today? There it is. On the dollar bill and the reverse of the Great Seal of the United States, and there are 13 levels. <clears throat> this is the constant recurring themes that I'm talking about because the same force is behind all these apparently different organizations and institutions. There it is in Freemasonry. There it is with the pyramid as the logo of MI5. There it is in the building basically of MI6. In the Olympic ceremony or one of them you had the building of the pyramid and then the almost homage bloody uh, um, worship of it immediately afterwards. This is a Roman Catholic bloody uh, church, look at it. Because why? The same thing. In the Olympics, you had the, the, the pyramid, uh, bloody um, floodlights, and also the, uh, uh, the eyes in the mascots. And somebody uh, put this together, and they put that and that and that together, and said, you know, what's going on? Well, what's going on is the same force controls all these apparently different institutions, and thus they use the same symbols. They control the entertainment industry. And thus, that's not a bloody diamond, that's a bloody pyramid, Jay-Z. There you are, Madonna, she comes up a lot. Uh, Angelina Jolie, there's Lady Gaga, the eye of uh, CBS. This is Gravity Falls, it's a Disney animated bloody program. There he is, there he is, uh, there he is. What's this doing in an animated program? Because they put their symbols in front of us. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing you find is the number of pictures of celebrities where they have an eye, uh, a hand over an eye. I'm not saying they all know. I mean, the photographer might say, oh, it would be a good picture, put your hand over your eye. But the number of them emphasizing one eye is unbelievable. Uh, these are just a few. I mean, what is it with that? Um, another common theme, fire. The archons and the jinn were said to be from luminous fire and made of smokeless fire. One of the great symbols of these bloodlines is the phoenix, the firebird. And the light that Freemasons talk about is not the light that other people talk about. One of the great symbols of the bloodlines and the network is the lighted torch or the flame. Um, and thus, at the closing ceremony of the Olympics in London, you had the massive emphasis on the phoenix because of the symbolism it represented. <clears throat> this is Manly P. Hall, uh, a Freemasonic historian. I think he got to the 32nd degree of Freemasonry in a book called Secret of All Ages, in which he's saying the eagle is actually just a publicly acceptable phoenix. European mysticism was not dead at the time of the Olymp United States of America was founded. Um, the hand of the mysteries controlled in the establishment of the new government for the signature of the mysteries may still be seen on the great seal of the United States of America. Careful analysis of the seal discloses a mass of occult and Masonic symbols, chief among them the so-called American Eagle, 
the American eagle upon the great seal is but a conventionalized phoenix. Um, and so many stories you read about demonic entities manifesting in rituals <clears throat> talk about them manifesting through fire. And fire is just a frequency. That's all it is. This is from a BBC documentary. This guy lights this newspaper simply from energy through his hands. It's just a frequency. And it, the frequency on other dimensions might not be the same as the one here. And in terms of fire and focus, with the, um, the Olympic flame going around uh, all over Britain, uh, the focus on that flame on an electromagnetic level is giving energy to that energy field till it becomes a massive energy field. This flame going around is not an Olympic tradition. It was brought in by the Nazis in 1936. And so that, would have, that focus would have created a massive energy field on the electromagnetic level. And it was brought to the opening ceremony. And uh, fire ritual relates to the god Baal, Molech, the one they worship in Bohemian Grove, Nimrod, Babylon, and the Roman god Saturn is going to become very, very um, important shortly. And the satanic ritual calendar has a particular day of July the 27th, the date of the Olympics of uh, opening ceremony in London. July 20th, 26th, abduction, ceremonial preparation, and holding of a sacrificial victim for grand climax. July 27th, grand climax, a day for sacrificing female adults and children. It was a massive, for whatever reason, a massive satanic day when that happened. And a billion people were focused on this, and that is what happened on 9-11. That focus would have allowed massive absorption of energy uh, as a result of the focus. Another common theme, ah, this is the one now. This is going to take us into some real <coughs> what, uh, weird and wonderful places. Um, Saturn is the key in so many ways to what is happening with all its moons. Um, just a reminder, Saturn um, may appear to be what it is in the holographic world, that, but actually, again, it's an information field. It is a consciousness. Um, everything is aware. Everything has a consciousness. So these um, planets and suns, they have consciousness. They have awareness. They are entities in their own right. And interestingly, this is an accepted ancient symbol of the sun. <clears throat> and people think, understandably, that it's a symbol of the sun that we know today. But is that symbol more likely to be the sun we know today or the sun we once knew? Saturn. Saturn is the key to understanding uh, so much. Uh, it was known as the old sun. It is known in a cult as the old sun, the dark sun and the dark lord, the lord of the rings. And the massive penny drop for me Whoa, the kaleidoscope moved when I started to realize that at least so many, if not all, the ancient sun gods were not gods of the sun we know today, but of the Saturn sun that was focused on before because it was in a different position. Saturn has long been symbolized as an eye. There's the eye in Freemasonry. There's the eye of Sauron in the Lord of the Rings, the reptilian eye, the symbol of the negative force. And what uh, happened in the m massive and brilliant work of da uh, David Talbot in the Saturn myth is that at some point there was an enormous ejection of debris in an explosion out of Saturn. And it formed like a, a luminous uh, crescent because it, it reflected light at certain points of the, of the day. And this, as the Earth moved on its axis, when um, viewed from the Earth, this appeared to move around Saturn. And at different points, there were different symbolism for different points. But this was the one that really was the focus of Saturn symbolism because this was when that luminous crescent was at its most luminous during the day. And so you find this symbol over and over in the ancient world. And this is a common recurring theme of Saturn. 
and this, the crescent symbolically and the disk of the Saturn sun, the dwarf star. And so from this came the horned god, and the horned goddess. There is Madonna in her Super Bowl performance at halftime, which was so Saturn in its symbolism, it was laughable, including the fiery eye. And in the movie version of The Lord of the Rings, you had the crescent holding the eye of Sauron. In um, Arabia, or you look at that as the, um, the symbol of, of, of Islam, the star, the sun, and the crescent. And the uh, Arabian god uh, Sin was symbolized as a crescent. Here you go. And I would suggest from David Talbot's point of view, and I think he's right, that this represents the crescent of Saturn. This is a, the guy who started a satanic uh, Saturn uh, uh, organization or secret society out of uh, Germany called the Brotherhood of Saturn. And there's that uh, symbol of the sun look with a dot. That's Saturn, not the sun that we have today, and the horned god. Um, Molech, who is symbolized at Bohemian Grove as the owl, is also symbolized as the bull. And there's the horns with Saturn in the middle. And so you have the bull gods of Mesopotamia. And the, the winged goddesses in that uh, state, this was often symbolized as the goddess with her uh, holding the god, her arms around the god or her wings around the god. Um, and there is another uh, version of that with the, the, uh, the god Saturn and the, the crescent. And there it is on the great seal of the United States, exactly the same symbolism. There it is in the Air Force Special Operations Command. There it is in the symbol of the House of Windsor. There it is in the United Nations with the target on the world, um, very appropriately. There it is in the eagle of, the, of Rome. Here it is in Freemasonry. Um, the flying disc of Egypt and other places is Saturn. And thus you have the Rosicrucian order, which connects into this network, uh, using that flying disc uh, symbolism. And so many of these logos carry the same uh, symbolism. And in her Super Bowl performance, Madonna had the flying disc um, of Saturn. This is another ancient Saturn symbol because at some points, apparently, it seemed to give off four very distinct lights, which became known as the four corners or the four rivers or the four ways. And so you find it, because of these bloodlines connecting into all these institutions, you find it in the Roman church, you find it on the mace in the houses of parliament, you find it on the crown, you found it in the um, Celtic cross, and you find it in the, one of the major secret societies in the network, the House of Malta. It's known as the Maltese cross. It was also symbolized, this uh, Saturn symbol and crescent, as the uh, flying god in, in his flying boat. This is Horus in his heavenly boat. Um, this is why it's used in uh, the boats used in Freemasonry. This is a Freemasonic building on the Isle of Wight, funnily enough. And that is massive. I'm not saying Annie Lennox knew it was. Just let's do this. It'd be a good idea. But that was massively Saturn symbolism when you watched it play out. Then you've got this... Um, symbol of the, the horned god, again, Saturn, Satan, as it also became known, uh, which is, you find with so many politicians, and Pat Robertson, this so-called Christian evangelist, yeah, okay. Um, and talking of horns and uh, horned gods, um, in astrology, Saturn is connected to Capricorn, and so one of the Saturn symbols is the goat, this again is the great uh, Freemasonic historian Manly P. Hall who said Pan, the goat god, was a composite creature, the upper part with the exception of his horns um, being human and the lower part in the form of a goat, the god himself is a symbol of Saturn because this planet is enthroned in Capricorn whose emblem is a goat. That is what that is, Bapomet, worshipped by Satanists. It's a symbol of Saturn. And I'm going somewhere with this because I'm going why they're focused on Saturn. So 
you have Baphomet, you have Beyonce, the wife of Jay-Z, with this big Baphomet ring, which is performing. You have Baphomet-dressed Lady Gaga, Baphomet-dressed uh, Madonna, and you have uh, Baroness Philippine de Rothschild from the, the wineries in France uh, with a massive Baphomet um, bro uh, or uh, necklace. And this is from the, the front cover of the Saturn myth with the symbolism described of these lights that went off from Saturn at certain points with the four main ones there. And there it is symbolized on one of these ancient tablets. And in St. Peter's Square, that is a mirror of the way that Saturn symbol uh, looks. And there it is on the thing that he has his biscuit in. Um, there, what he's doing his stuff. Now, this is inside the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in Great Queen Street. Great Queen was the name of the Babylonian goddess in London. Because, this will become sim uh, significant in part three, um, this crescent holding the sphere also became symbolized as twin pillars. And so you have Saturn, there's the crescent, being held up by the twin pillars. This is in the, one of the Freemasonic uh, centers of the world in London. Numerologically, digitally, Saturn is number eight. And uh, this has uh, led to symbolism of Saturn in terms of the spider. Thus you have, in Madonna's uh, Super Bowl performance, the winged disc uh, symbolized with the spider in the center. Now this is fascinating. This is called the magic square of Saturn. And um, it's also, not by coincidence, the magic square of Freemasonry. And it's magic because of this reason. If you go that way, that way, that way, that way, or that way, or that way, all the numbers of in, in, in the three blocks in line add up to 15. And in numerology, uh, you keep adding uh, uh, numbers um, until they become a single number. And so 15, in numerologically, uh, term, numerological terms, is 6. So 666, 666 in all directions. And um, the black and white squares, for reasons I'll, I'll have to go into in detail in a book, because, uh, you know, there's so much to get through today, also relates to Saturn. And so you have them in Freemasonic temples, black and white squares, and you have them in the major cathedrals, like Westminster Abbey and stuff, because of this connection I'm talking about. Now, this is called the sigil of Saturn. And they get this symbol by drawing in the magic square of Saturn from one to two, and then to three, from four to five uh, to six, etc. So they get it. Now you turn that straight up, and that's what that is. It's the sigil of Saturn. And this is a major symbol of Saturn going way back, the six-pointed star. It just so happens to be the very symbol from which we get the name Rothschild, one of the major families in this network. Because they used to be called Bauer. They lived in Frankfurt in Germany. But they had this red uh, six-pointed star um, hexagram on the front of their house and they changed their name to Bauer, from Bauer to Red Shield in German, Rothschild, Red Sign or Red Shield, uh, Rothschild. So they're named after this uh, very symbol. And it was they that created Israel, not on behalf of Jewish people, on behalf of their bloody agenda that, that treats Jewish people with as much disdain as any of the rest of us. And so you have their symbol on the flag of Israel. They used the six-pointed star so much in uh, law enforcement. This is on a public building in Toronto, right in the center of the six-pointed star, there's the horned god. Um, there's the sheriff and a, a, a medal. There is the, uh, the six-pointed star representing Saturn on an ancient uh, uh, you know, uh, clay depiction. And there it is on Credo Mutwa's 500 to 1,000 year old Zulu um, hand symbol. Uh, you, if you do that on the uh, dollar bill, you get the six-pointed star and the, uh, that, those letters make an anagram of Mason, interestingly. Inside the Great Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in Great Queen Street, London, there is the Twin Towers, symbolic of the crescent, and there is Saturn again, the six-pointed star. Now, of course, the Roman Church and Christianity 
that is uh, anti-Freemasonry and anti-secret societies because they're naughty, but it's on his bloody fish hat, look. Right? They're everywhere because the same force is in control. Here you go, I have a bit more Madonna. Yeah, there you go. And, and in the, on the Great Seal of the United States, those 13 stars make up a six-pointed star, not by accident. And therefore, again, we keep coming back to this, all these different areas of society are only in the end focused on one thing. Satanism is Saturnism. Um, this is Fritz Springmeier, a, a long-time uh, researcher into this, and uh, symbolism, etc., and Satanism. Saturn is an important key to understanding the long heritage this conspiracy has back to antiquity. The city of Rome was originally known as the Saturnia, or city of Saturn. The Roman Catholic Church retains much of, the, of Saturn worship in its ritual. Saturn also relates to Lucifer. In various occult dictionaries, Saturn is associated with evil. And uh, this is the remains of the uh, temple of Saturn in Rome. And uh, just next to this is this place uh, called Capitoline Hill now, but before that called Mon Saturnus, the Hill of Saturn. And um, this is a very um, uh, symbolically important place to the bloodlines. And, and this whole thing about the skull and bones, uh, Capitoline Hill comes from cap, caput, meaning dead, because they were supposed to have found a, a human skull there, and they call it caput, Capitoline Hill. That's why we say caput when something's dead. And you have the theme in Christianity of Golgotha and Calgary, the place of the skull, hill of the skull. And Capitoline Hill became Capitol Hill when the bloodlines moved in on America. Now, in the North Pole, uh, the Northern Pole of Saturn, is a permanent storm which make, takes the form of a hexagon. And uh, this has been found uh, by the Cassini uh, spacecraft and I think the Voyager one before that in the early 80s. And uh, the hexagon also is an expression of the hexagram or uh, of the six-pointed star. Uh, because all these different symbols that I'm going to talk about now are different expressions of the same frequency state. So you look at this crop circle from uh, England this year, and it is a hexagon. But a hexagon is a flattened out cube. So when you look at it from another angle, it's a cube. Well, it just so happens that an ancient symbol of Saturn is the cube, especially the black cube. And I would suggest that's what they are. The Kaaba, the focus of worship in, in um, Islam, Kaaba means cube. The Teflin, the cube on the head in Judaism. And when people go to uh, uh, worship around the Kaaba, they're told to pray in concentric circles. Remind you of anything? And they're told to walk around it and th their energy can be trawled. And if you focus on something that represents Saturn, Saturn is where the energy goes. In, in Judaism, they have Solomon's temple. Every syllable of Solomon means the sun. And the Holy of Holies in the so-called Solomon's temple was supposed to be a cube. They talk in uh, Revelation about the new Jerusalem in cube terms. There's these massive cubes that they use. This is outside the, um, uh, uh, one of the banks uh, near Wall Street, near where the protests are. And you see these black cubes and cubes like used by, uh, by Apple and stuff. Saturn symbolism. In uh, uh, Doctor Who, they had this recent one where they, we, the Earth was invaded by black cubes. Star Trek, you had the Borg, who were these cyborg-like, exactly as the, um, uh, are described by the, uh, the Gnostics of the Archons, and they used to move around in these cubes. If you uh, geometrically represent the cross, then it is a flattened-out cube. When you look at the... Uh, the uh, depictions of, 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 of these uh, people, not, not Lady Gaga, but others, these religious leaders with the halo, well, that comes from Saturn as well, that halo when, when that luminous crescent was in that position. Astrologically, that's the symbol of Saturn. And what they uh, symbolized this as was the sickle and the hammer. And when the Rothschilds created um, the Soviet Union, provable fact if you look at the evidence, they use the symbol of Saturn as the symbol of the Soviet Union. There's the, that symbol on this guy from the Brotherhood of Saturn. The uh, Jesuits are a major secret society in this global network, and there's the symbol of Saturn in their uh, symbolism, very bloody clearly. The uh, 
The snake on the cross also relates to this in, in some ways. Now this is going to take us uh, uh, forward here because the god of Saturn of the Greeks was called Kronos. And Kronos was, because he was the god Saturn, the, the sickle, the scythe, was represented as uh, holding the scythe and also he was depicted as the god of time. And he had the beard, uh, the white beard. And he became old father time. That's Kronos, that's the god of Saturn. He also became the grim reaper because Saturn is the planet, I say, son of death. Um, and Kronos became crown, a symbol of the bloodlines. Uh, uh, Kali, uh, a goddess related to Saturn, uh, it was called the Black One and uh, the, the goddess of time, depicted with a protruding tongue. There's Madonna again. I mean, she must have the bloody book she works through, this one. <laughs> the god El, the Hebrew god El, was their god of Saturn. So El and Elohim are demiurge and archons, I would suggest. So we have Archangel Els, Mike El, Gabriel, Yuri El, Raphael, another name for Jesus, Emmanuel. We have the Gospels, Chapel, Elders, elevated to the priesthood, elections where pawns are elected to serve the elite. We have Isis, Ra, El, the all names relating to Saturn. Saturn, Kronos, Satan, Black Sun, Dark Lord, they're all the same thing. The expression of this force. And here you have Moloch who they worship at Bohemian Grove, and he is a god of Saturn, this recurring theme. They also represent um, Moloch as a bull, as I said earlier, and so you have that as the uh, symbol of Wall Street. And the golden calf in the Bible is Moloch, Saturn. The Greeks talked about Saturn uh, used to eat his own children. And here's the colors of Satanism and the colors of Saturn, black and red, same as the royal protocol. The, the robes of the judge, the robes of the uh, clergy, the, the square hats of um, uh, universities, the, the, the hammer that the judge uses, it's all Saturn symbolism. You see Saturn profusely used in symbolism of the corporate world. And this, uh, well, this earth, wind and fire, they got the bloody set. Um, there's the eye. There's the six-pointed star, there's the step pyramid, there's the winged disc, and there's bloody Saturn. And then, therefore, you look at religions and secret societies and Satanism, they're worshipping Saturn. Then you look astrologically, in other words, energetically. Banking is astrologically ruled by Saturn. Politics and institutions of state at all levels, astrologically ruled by Saturn. Corporations, astrologically ruled by Saturn. Law and court system, astrologically ruled by Saturn. Science, astrologically ruled by Saturn. Saturn worship, Satan worship. And it's interesting that you have the uh, god of Saturn, uh, Kronos, with the beard, and, and represent, and all these bloody religions, they have bloody beards. And then you have God depicted, depicted as a man with a white beard on a cloud or on a throne, and there's God, Charlton Heston type God. That's Yahweh depicted with a, with a beard and stuff. And then we have Santa with the white beard. Santa, anagram of Satan from Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a festival in Rome where they worshipped the god Saturn. And they gave, uh, it was in the same period to the run up to our Christmas. And they gave gifts, they decorated trees and they hung sprigs of bloody holly. So that is Saturn, symbolism, a man with a white beard. This is Ancient of Days, a painting by William Blake from, I think, 1794 or something like that. Ancient of Days is an old name for God. And he's depicting God. He was a very deep esoteric thinker and, and great knowledge, uh, William Blake. And uh, he's depicting God with the white beard. That's Saturn, Kronos. On the GE building in the Rockefeller uh, Center in New York, there's Kronos again. Now the Freemasons, they call their god the great architect of the universe. The Demiurge was known by the Gnostics as the great architect of the universe. Which brings us to the white bearded architect of the Matrix, in the Matrix movie series. So where is this leading us? 
Well, again, this needs to go if we're going to go anywhere with this because I'm going into fantastic areas here, but this is where the information has taken me very, very clearly. Um, and the hardest thing to see is what is in front of your eyes, as this man rightly said. The Gnostics talked about the fact that the Archons make something appear to happen that does not actually happen. They can induce a virtual reality experience. The uh, Islamic people and pre-Islamic people talk about the jinn manipulating humans by creating illusions. I was uh, in New York in 2010 and someone took me to the subway station for Ground Zero. And when I saw it, it was like, whoa, it hit me big time. There was, first of all, these eyes all along the platforms, but there is this massive depiction of the world on the floor, and then there's an eye, and going out from this eye are these broadcast transmissions. And that hit me so powerfully. And Neil Haig was with me, and we kind of looked at each other and said, that's Saturn, isn't it? And remember, physicists have said uh, only this last few days, they may have evidence the universe is a computer simulation. Well, I say that it's a virtual reality, which has been hacked into, and that hack is the reality that we're experiencing, the fake reality. And that hack, I say, comes from Saturn. Because I'm saying that these rings are actually a massive broadcast transmission system which is broadcasting a fake reality within the frequency range that we are decoding and therefore we are picking up that uh, fake reality. When the Cassini spacecraft arrived at Saturn in 2004, um, found many things that was unexplainable, you know, things like the the hexagon North Pole storm and stuff like that. But they also found extraordinarily powerful sound coming from Saturn. This is, this is part of what they recorded. Nice man. Um, and I got uh, sent this by a sound engineer, works in sound engineering for a living, and it's one of the rings of Saturn, and he said, I see that every day. That's bloody sound. They're sound waves. And this is in cymatics, this is a six-pointed star. And of course we have the hexagon going round and round and round at Saturn's North Pole. This is a standing wave created by sound, rings. Uh, this is at the south pole of Saturn and it's a permanent ice storm. This is a standing wave created by sound. And these are symbols created by sound, like somatics. And a certain frequency created this perfect six pointed star with the hexagon in the middle and the hexagon there. Therefore, the sound creates the frequency, uh, creates the symbol, and in the same way the symbol represents the sound and the frequency. The, the, the symbols are just holographic representations of vibrational waveform states. I would suggest in this, these symbols cases, representatives of the sound frequency coming off Saturn. Same with all these symbols and numerological manipulations. The sound and the symbol are different expressions of the same thing. Thus, if we in the holographic realm are constantly bombarded with these symbols, it is on an energetic level feeding us the frequency field of what they represent. And Saturn, when described pre-cataclysmic, didn't have rings. So where'd they come from? Well, maybe it had rings, but it weren't rings we could see. We can see them now. 
Well, this guy, Norman Bergeron, has a long, he's in his 90s now, I think. He has a long, long history in space research, technological research, going way back. And his life changed when he started studying the pictures that came back from the Voyager 1 and 2 space uh, expeditions to Saturn. They arrived in 1980 and 81. Because when he studied them, he realized there was something very strange about Saturn's rings. And he said this in his book, The Ring Makers of Saturn. Several years ago, a number of folks in the astrology and uh, astronomy, rather, and physics world began theorizing that these rings had to be much younger than the universe, perhaps only about 100 million years old. But one pair of pictures shows a change in five minutes. An impression is conveyed that the latest reported measurements purport to be the true ones, when in reality, all might uh, quite nearly be correct at the time of observation. General reluctance to accept variable ring system geometry occurs because of apparent failure to identify a physical mechanism suitable for producing recurrent change. In other words, classic mainstream science, if we can't explain it, we'll kid ourselves it doesn't exist. And he also found these in the pictures coming back from Voyager, and the Cassini ones found them too. And he calls them electromagnetic vehicles, and they are massive. Some of them several times bigger than the Earth. But again, we need to move our sense of perception. In terms of size uh, representation, this is the Earth against the size of Saturn. They're not, talk they're not talking the same perception of big um, in terms of outside of the Earth. And here are some of the other pictures of these electromagnetic vehicles picked up by these NASA craft. Why aren't they all in the papers being talked about? You think, what the hell is this? No, no, nothing. Thanks to Bergeron, we've, we've seen the, their existence. This is the uh, Hubble uh, telescope. Let's pick one of them up. Look at the size of the bloody thing. And uh, here's a few Cassini uh, spacecraft pictures, still pictures put together. What the hell is that? Exactly what Bergeron was describing from Voyager. And this is the other thing. He found pictures of stuff spewing out of these electromagnetic vehicles into the rings of Saturn and bloody making them or extending them. And what is said to be in the rings of Saturn, I guess thus that's why we can see them, um, is like ice and stuff. I think and I would suggest that eventually they will realize that there is a crystal substance being put into those rings that has a dramatic impact on their ability to transmit information. In 2009, NASA um, released this picture, which is uh, a ring around Saturn, which is from 3.7 million uh, miles out to uh, 7.4 million, and that ring could encompass a billion Earths. I suggest that there are rings that we can see, but there are sound rings that we can't see that are coming out across, and we're picking them up. They make something appear to happen that does not actually happen. They can induce a virtual reality experience. The Saturn matrix, as I call it, is a frequency band which we are decoding as a fake reality and I suggest my view we will find that the edge of that frequency band is what we call the speed of light and beyond it you go out of the matrix and when all the genetic tinkering that the ancients talked about went on the human form was being manipulated to be tuned in to receive and transmit within the frequency band of this Saturn broadcast and pulling people from a heart state beyond the matrix into an emotional uh, uh, point of interaction ba uh, massively in the matrix was a major way of tuning us into this fake reality. We talk about people who don't think for themselves as being in the box. Maybe we ought to say that they're in the cube. And they want to shut the heart down, and they have to so many people 
because it takes us beyond the bounds of time and space, beyond the matrix, because I suggest that what we call time, as we decode it, is in this matrix transmission. I'll whip through this quickly, because um, I've talked about this in my books at great length, and I've talked about this at Under London Talks. But um, I, I, I say the moon is a construct, or a part construct, um, this is a book called Who Built the Moon by Christopher Knight and Alan Butler. It's absolutely brilliant in the way that it uh, puts the case for the moon not being uh, real in terms of a natural body. But interestingly, what they find in that book is the mathematics and geometry between the sun, the moon, and the earth are fantastic in terms of their synchronicity, and it does not apply in any way to the rest of the solar system. And the Gnostic writings found in Nagamani in 1945 1,600 years old or more, say that this is a separate system operating within the Archon system of the inorganic universe. They say in the book, um, the authors, the mass involved in the Earth, Moon, Sun system is nothing less than staggering, with, uh, and that the uh, Moon has been put there with the accuracy of the proverbial Swiss watchmaker. So when viewed from the Earth, it's the size of the Sun at an eclipse. The BBC did a uh, a program, who built, uh, do we really need the moon? And it said the moon is now in a perfect position to sustain life on earth and its effect on the earth, but it's just a coincidence. I think not. We only see the near side of the moon. We don't see the far side of the moon. And the authors say in that book, the moon is bigger than it should be, apparently older than it should be, uh, much lighter in mass than it should be. It occupies an unlikely orbit and is it so extraordinary that all existing explanations for its presence are fraught with difficulties and none of them could be considered remotely watertight. The mainstream theory is that the Earth was hit by a Mars-type planet when it was forming and a chunk came off and became the Moon, called the Whack Theory. That didn't pan out, so they came up with a double Whack Theory where it was hit by the planet, it went away and gave it another smack and then it became the moon. Now, of course, it doesn't pan out because it's nonsense. They don't know. Why don't they just say it's not a bad thing we don't know? There's lots of things we don't know. Um, the best explanation for the moon is observational error. The moon doesn't exist, said this uh, scientist at the Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. It's easier to explain the non-existence of the moon than its existence, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on. And, and you know, I'll, I'll go through this because um, I don't want to run over too much uh, time. I'll just mention a few things about the moon. Um, these two scientists from the Soviet Academy of Sciences wrote a detailed article in 1970 uh, headed, Is the Moon the Creation of an Alien Intelligence? And they explained in scientific terms um, why the Moon cannot be a natural body and in doing so explained all the anomalies that if it is a natural body cannot be explained. Um, this guy, Sergeant Wolf, talked at the National Press Club a few years ago and told of his experiences on the inside at NASA where he saw uh, 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 things like um, alien bases on the moon and stuff like that. And all, there's all these towers and strange phenomenon, like this blue light called blue gem or blue uh, dome that they can't explain on the moon. And these artifacts on the moon that clearly are not natural. Look at that one. What the bloody hell is that? They can't explain and they don't talk about them. These are pictures of what are claimed to be statues on the moon. There's so much we don't know. In symbolic terms, maybe in a bit more than that, the moon is a bit like the Death Star of this big time insider, George Lucas, in, in the sense that it's actually some kind of technological construct. And it's my view, as I've said before in previous books, that what the moon is doing, in its present use anyway, is taking this Saturn broadcast and acting as an amplifier to fire it at the Earth, so we get it in massively increased power and therefore effect. It's acting a bit like a uh, a, uh, a dish transmitting uh, information which we're picking up and decoding into a fake reality. Now, um, nine months after I'd written that in a book called The uh, Human Race Get Off Your Knees, someone sent me a, um, an email from Brazil, I think it was, a lady, and said, have you read this book, Earth, by Barbara Maciniak? Because I've just read your book and I think you'd find it interesting. And she sent me some page numbers. Barbara Maciniak is what they call a channel. And lots of channels are not channels. Uh, they just think they are, but you know, if you get a genuine one, then you can, you can get out there and bring information in, out from other dimensions into this one. You can get some profound information that way. And she's done a lot of great stuff, uh, Barbara Maciniak. I've met her a few times. Anyway, I, I hadn't read Earth. I'd read the first book um, that she, she wrote, but, but not um, Earth. Anyway, I sent for it. I went through the page numbers, and I'm like, whoa, this is nine months after I've said this stuff in... Um, 
Human Race Get Off Your Knees. And uh, this was a channeled book, and this is what was in the book. 1996, I think this came out. The moon is a very powerful electromagnetic computer. The energy from the moon has been beaming electromagnetic frequencies onto the Earth for eons now to maintain the two-stranded DNA. The moon is a satellite that was constructed it was anchored outside Earth's atmosphere as a mediating and monitoring device, a supercomputer or eye in the sky. Earth must be owned by those who dwell there. However, it is not. You have outside gods, creator energies, who prevent you as a species from having free reign with your kundalini. That's the, the energy of awakening, in effect. The influence of the moon as a main satellite computer affects all of the Earth. The moon's programs have for eons been of great limitation towards human beings. There are repetitive cycles that the moon creates to which you respond. The tales about the full moon and insanity, madness and heightened bleeding are all quite true. You know that television influences you a great deal. The moon is the same way. And astrologically, just as a very quick aside, when that great um, rearrangement happened, of course, astrologically, everything changed as well in terms of the influence of the astrological energies upon the human perception, because suddenly all these bodies are in different positions to where they were before. So the Saturn moon matrix, as I call it, I say anyway, is um, generating a frequency band, a, a fake reality, which we are decoding to be what seems to be a real reality, and the genetic manipulation has tuned us into it and created this cycle of round and round the garden. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, as the guy said in the video. And uh, Neil Haig has this um, concept of moonopoly uh, or Saturn moonopoly. And it goes like this. You get up in the morning and you have your breakfast and then you go to work. And then you have your lunch, sandwich normally, and then I go to work, and then I go home, and then I have my tea, and then I watch a bit of telly, and then I go to bed. Then I get up and I go to work, and then I have my lunch, sandwich normally. And, I mean, look at us. We are infinite consciousness, infinite awareness. All there is, has been, and ever can be. Is that all we are capable of? No. But we are locked into these cycles to which we respond. No response. See it as you couldn't see it before. An end to work, buy, consume, die. That's what that is. And this matrix creates a firewall that holds us from seeing further into the energy field and holds us in this tiny frequency band we call visible light. What they've done is taken the, uh, the, uh, the universal energy field, the universal construct, and they have hijacked, hacked into it, and they're feeding a fake reality to us from within that construct. And, and therefore, it's gold! Oh, my life's in a terrible state. I'm just making adjustments to my life. Oh, life's great. And they're all freaking illusions. Um, we're like in this war. The, you know those scientists that have been suggesting in the last few days that um, the universe might be a computer simulation? They actually said, like a prisoner in a pitch black cell, we may never be able to see the walls of our prison. Why? Because they are vibrational walls and I suggest that they are the speed of light. She's not the fastest speed. Sorry, Einstein, mate. It's pedestrian. We're talking all possibility, darling. And so when we look into the night sky, are we seeing what's real or are we seeing a projection? I talked to him, I think it was my last book or the one before that. I had a profound experience as a little boy when I was first taken to the London Planetarium when I looked and saw the night sky on the roof of the planetarium and it looked so bloody real. And, and it, it hit me and it's never left me that actually when I look at the night sky, that ain't actually what I'm looking at. Firewall. All that we see or seem is just a dream within a bigger dream. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Caught in the landslide, no escape from reality. Open your eyes, look at the skies and see. Is it a sky? Or is it a projection? And so, when we come to the matrix, and this scene in the matrix, I call it the Saturn moon matrix, maybe 
connected to other things we don't know yet. This is so, so real and so, so the world we live in. If you add two words. The Saturn moon matrix is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neil. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch, a prison for your mind. Archon world. We live in Archon world. Um, I'm going to bring this down now before we, we have a break. I'll bring this down into the world that we live in now. Um, this guy, a great cosmologist, who knew far more than he was saying or was allowed to say, um, uh, Carl Sagan, he wrote a book, The Dragons of Eden, in which he talked about um, the fundamentally uh, importance of understanding the reptilian impact of reptilian genetics on human behavior. Because uh, the reptilian brain fundamentally affects human behavior. And I suggest that before the genetic tinkering, either that wasn't there or was nothing like as, as powerful as it is now. And I came across these books after I was a long way down the line. I came across these books by Carlos Castaneda in which um, he was um, quoting a Central American shaman called Don Juan Matas. And when I read some of the stuff in these books that the shaman had said, it was like, whoa, we talk about confirmation. He talks about the archons and the jinn in exactly the same terms, but he calls them the flyers. But they're the same, uh, they're the same entities. And this is what he said about them in the books. We have a predator that came from the depths of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands we don't do so. Indeed, we are held prisoner. They took over us because we are food to them, energy. And they squeeze us mercilessly because we are their sustenance. Just as we rear chickens in coops, the predators rear us in human coops, human eros. Therefore, their food is always available to them. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. Think, matters said for a moment, and tell me how you would explain the contradictions between the intelligence of man the engineer and the stupidity of his systems of belief or the stupidity of his contradictory behavior. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our systems of beliefs, yes, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who have set up our dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetedness, greed and cowardice. It is the predator who makes us complacent, routinary and egomanical, feeding the wolf. In order to keep us obedient and meek and weak, the predators have engaged themselves in a stupendous maneuver. Stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist, a horrendous maneuver from the point of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with the fear of being discovered any minute now. They gave us their mind, and that, I suggest, is how they've done it. And they also more than gave us our mind, they gave us their frequency via junk or non-coding DNA. We are at last, hallelujah, brother and sister, having mainstream scientists seeing the blatant, beyond belief, obvious, that 98% of DNA, which they have called junk because they didn't know what it did and said it had no function, actually does, stands back in amazement, have a function. And in that 98% of DNA, non-coding DNA, uh, is our programs, behavior programs, uh, perception programs, emotional programs, that if we are not beyond mind, body, conscious, we lock into and they become us. People in that state, I suggest, it is very possible, and I say highly likely, 
they can go through an entire human lifetime and not have an original thought or emotional response that isn't coming from the program. This is um, Boston University and Harvard Medical School research. They examined 37 DNA sequences containing at least 50,000 base pairs and one with 2.2 million base pairs. Lead researcher Eugene Stanley, non-coding DNA sequences do contain a structured language fundamentally unlike the coding in genes. We therefore need to consider the possibility that the junk DNA may carry some kind of message. Yes, it does, many. And one of them is the human control system when we're pulled into body-mind. Russian DNA research. It appears that the languages we were looking for are in fact hidden in the 98% junk DNA contained in our own genetic apparatus. The basic principle of these languages is similar to the language of holographic images based on the principles of laser radiations of the genetic structures which operate together as a quasi-intelligent system. And this uh, recent uh, announcement by this uh, institute at the Harvard Medical School all data that humanity creates in a year can be stored on four grams of DNA. That's how much information we have in the human structure. And therefore, if you can put emotional programs, emotional response programs into the, uh, into the genetic structure and then create a society designed to constantly trigger those programs, then you can have a massive, constantly recurring a tidal wave of low vibrational emotional energy. And when you, to, to feed off, and when you go beyond the body, like with Jill Bolte Taylor earlier, or these near death experiences, what is the common theme when, we go, when they go beyond the body? I felt calm, at peace, I just was. There was no thought, pattern, and no human emotion. Because so much of it is coming from the body. It's a program. And when you go into the heart and you go beyond time and space, you stop reacting in the, in the sense of the program and you stop delivering the food, the sustenance of that which is behind it. I did not judge and did not feel I was judged. I loved being in that painless state of existence. And if you want to feed off human energy, low vibrational, if you've got these programs within the human genetic structure generating that energy while well, you're home and bloody dry. This is the mind that we've been connected to. Why do rules have power over our minds? It's all about rules, because it's all about control. And this part of the brain, the reptilian brain, where we get cold-blooded behavior, territoriality, desire to control, might, right is might, and all that stuff, um, might is right, um, that is massively part of the reaction system. Because the reptilian brain is about survival. It's about constantly scanning the environment for threats to survival. Not just physical survival, but survival financially, survival of the job, survival of the relationship. Uh, be afraid, be very afraid, because the big man monster is coming as soon as we've invented him. This is why we're constantly given reasons to be frightened, because that locks us into the reptilian brain and therefore into this collective mind. And Don Juan Matters said, I know that even now, though you never have suffered hunger, you have food anxiety, which is none other than the anxiety of the predator who fears that at any moment now its maneuver is going to be uncovered and food is going to be denied. Through the mind, which after all is their mind, the predators inject into the lives of human beings whatever is convenient for them. And they ensure in this manner a degree of security to act as a buffer against their fear. Sorcerers of ancient Mexico reason that man must have been a complete being at one point. With stupendous insights, feats of awareness that are mythological legends nowadays. Absolutely. And then everything seems to disappear. And we have now a sedated man. What I'm saying is that what we have against us is not a simple predator. It is very smart and organized. It follows a methodical system to render us useless. Man, the magical being that he is destined to be, yes, and she, uh, is no longer magical. He's an average piece of meat. There are no more dreams for man than the dreams of an animal who is being raised to be a piece of meat, trite, conventional, imbecilic. Control of perception. And if you look at the Avatar movie, 
it is so symbolic because you had the heart society and it was taken over, this connected society of greater awareness was taken over by this left brain, merciless, heartless invasion by symbolically earth troops with their technology and all that stuff. And you even had the symbolism of these uh, invaders infiltrating the blue people society by operating inside an outer shell of blue people so that they didn't know that they were being infiltrated. Now, are we as a human race, there are seven billion of us now and more, the number of people in full knowledge who are behind this are tiny, tiny, and they can only do it by dividing and ruling us. Are we going to stand up, come together and face this, or look the other bloody way and go on walking into a level of enslavement that would make George Orwell bloody wince. As, as uh, Martin Luther King said, a man can't ride your back unless it's bent. Freedom is the sure possession of those alone who have the courage to defend it. Okay, I'll be back in uh, 40 minutes, got so much to get through, at which point I'm going to go into the world we live in today and why it is so crazy. Thank you very much. Thank you. This break will last for 40 minutes. 40 minutes.